I will start recording. Uh, okay, so uh, welcome everybody. This is our first session on this book, um, uh, which I picked out because I thought people were uh, quite interested in phenomenology and precursors of existentialism after our previous book. Um, and this is like a good intro to it in the sense that um, the sort of modern version of that, despite its sort of precursors and people like Kierkegaard and so forth, the modern version of it or others in the 19th century really starts with um, Husserl. And Levinas is a good intro to Husserl. Husserl himself is a famously um, um, sometimes difficult to read writer in the sense that he tends to be long-winded and uh, repeat himself. And um, <laughs> the concepts are entirely clear to him, but he has this like intuitive method of he's expecting you to follow along and see the thing for yourself and verify it that way. So you don't you don't get the um, uh, guideposts you might get from something logically following from the previous two sentences. You have to go look at the phenomena itself. And that works fine as long as you're looking at the same thing he is, and he's right. Um, but uh, uh, knowing what he's looking at can be difficult, um, especially early. Um, that is when you're when you're new to him, um, and it's in translation and all kinds of uh, challenges. So anyway, Husserl is uh, definitely worth reading, but um, uh, he can be a difficult guy to just dive into yourself. Um, Levinas uh, here, is, this is a very young Levinas, and uh, he's like giving a very sort of um, uh, fast overview in a, in a uh, chattier fashion from outside, so to speak. So he's less concerned with establishing each point and more concerned with, you know, uh, where was Husserl going with all this and why did he care and sort of stuff, um, that sort of thing. Uh, Levinas himself is an interesting character in his own right, like a generation afterwards. Um, we should maybe talk a little bit about who all these people are and so forth, but. Um, Hello. Um, but uh, so before we get to first reactions, I just wanted to um, uh, get some assessments from people on uh, first, did you manage to do the reading? Second, um, uh, had you read um, Husserl before? What experience have you had with Husserl before, if any? Um, uh, Levinas before? Um, how much do you know about sort of uh, history? Or should I go over all the history of who all these people were and when they were and so forth? Um, so just level of familiarity is what I'm looking for. Um, and any answer is a good one. I just need to know so I know what to cover. Um, so uh, Joe, we're gonna start with you. Yes, uh, first, I was always intrigued by Husserl. I, didn't, I had no idea who or what he represented or claimed. Uh, I, my attention was sparked when I realized that Heidegger had been his student and I very much enjoyed our, our sessions with Being in Time and the subsequent uh, time we spent with the Heidegger works. Uh, now we're going to uh, Husserl. Now, Husserl had come to my attention earlier, about 40 years earlier, when a very good friend of mine, who's now a very uh, a nice, probably emeritus philosophy professor at Lehigh University, uh, was in very much uh, into what was interesting about Husserl. And I did had no clue. And I, why is he so interested? And uh, that's intrigued me since I knew nothing about Husserl. So now I'm pleased to learn something about him. Now I begin to see from the first two chapters we just finished what my friend was into. The whole idea that consciousness itself is a separate, uh, uh, I don't want to even start throwing words at it, uh, being a mode of existence, whatever. And that's that's intriguing. And I like the, I want to see more, tell me the distinction between him and Berkeley. I mean, I'm really into that. Another thing, finally, uh, footnote five on the first early sections, because I finished the book reading and then went back to start rereading. Footnote five, so make some big distinction in how the word ontology is used. And I just, I dropped my jaw because we just spent a lot of time going through people like Suarez and you know, all that. Uh, and I just uh, said, I uh, have to ask Jason what footnote five means. <laughs> so there I am. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, um... And just what about things like the timeline? And I mean, you, you know there were, that uh, you know Heidegger was you know Husserl's student, et cetera. But do you know anything about sort of background of what Husserl was himself most concerned with when he was starting out, and or anything like that? Not really. Okay. So we should probably go over some of that history. Um, Craig, you want to go next on this? Okay. So for uh, better or worse, I read the entire. Um, preface and all the different pieces there, which had a lot of good stuff in it that you're going to go over, I think, 
and a lot of a lot of confusion in it. Um, I, I I tend to not like the translator who uh, chooses to leave technical terms in. Took me the longest time to figure out what he meant by LU as a cultural uh, source until I realized mm -hmm. that, that was the German for logical investigations. Yeah. So yeah, that was that was frustrating, and uh, still carrying through some of that. But yeah, I tried reading Husserl, and I agree with you. It's like digging into a swamp. It was just uh, uh, more convoluted than Gilson was. So uh, so that was the challenge. Uh, I did get through the first two chapters of this book after struggling with all the prefatory stuff and. Uh, and we'll get to a couple of questions there. I'm familiar with Levinas uh, and Derrida uh, and various comments through that and the, the problems of what, uh, which was well done in the in the preface of, of what the options really were in Europe and uh, at the time. <clears throat> and uh, and yeah, my uh, my uh, I still remember the day in philosophy class when. Uh, when the professor walked in and said, oh, hey, class has appeared to me. We're going to study Berkeley today. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so he did a great job of, of introducing the basics of Berkeley and uh, or Berkeley, as he called him. But uh, but other than that, yeah, uh, there'll be some various questions that will come up when we get there. Right. Um, uh, we'll, we'll dig through those. Uh, I agree with Joe. Ontology, especially its revival now. Uh, with Harmon and other people is, uh, and, and uh, Roberto Poli and a few others have been reading, uh, ontology has taken on its whole new world, and especially in computer science. And so the, the relationship there, same deal with the, the difference between uh, when he gets into consciousness, uh, there's a lot of people writing in journal of consciousness study that probably should have read him. Um, and then, uh, his uh, word on intuition, which is a technical term in Jung's writings, and so some some work on on the uh, cross distinction between Jung's use of intuition and uh, and the way intuition is used here would be helpful. Okay. Yep. We'll definitely talk about the concept of intuition. Uh, in some ways, it's about the uh, kind of what the book is about, but um, uh, it's useful to have at least a an early version of how different some of these technical terms are for different people. Um, okay, um, Vasan, do you want to jump in here? Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, yeah, I just came across your group like yesterday and thought I'd stop in and, and see what it's like. I'm not familiar with all of the names that were listed, um, but I have read some Heidegger and Tillich. And so based okay. on that, I thought, oh, great. I, you know, I would love to study more. I don't know the timeline or relationship between all the names that you Irish, mentioned. Yeah. And since I just came across you yesterday, I haven't bought or read the book at all. Sure, okay, no problem. Uh, so questions always useful there. Um, so uh, let's start with just a little bit about who the characters are then. Uh, so um, uh, Husserl um, was writing from basically uh, 1900 to about uh, late 1930s, um, and he's uh, uh, in, in in Germany. Um, he's uh, doing uh, phenomenology. He starts off working on uh, problems in logic and the foundations of math, actually, and he gets especially concerned with what is pro called the problem of psychologism and logic, um, which is something that also people like Frege were interested in. So this is kind of a point where um, this sort of uh, German philosophical continental tradition was sort of in close contact with what we could think of as the analytic philosophy, kind of um, uh, English positivist uh, logic philosophy uh, sort of uh, tradition. Um, and sort of he, he, he came out of that tradition. He was studying foundation, uh, logic and the foundations of math um, and uh, um, a critique of psychologism. What does that mean? Uh, psychologism in logic is the idea that uh, somehow logic is telling us something about the empirical rules of thought, how the mind thinks empirically. Um, and Frege is famously arguing against that, that no, logic is a, a normative thing. It's not telling you how the mind does think, but how the mind should think. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, so there was a you know, pre previous, some previous uh, people in um, British empiricism who were famous as, psycholo uh, as psychologists in logic in that sense, or people like John Stuart Mill. Um, uh, but there were others, uh, 
in the positive tradition around the same time. Um, anyway, so so when we talk about psychologism in logic, we're not really talking about are you interested in psychology, the discipline. Um, it's specifically the notion that um, you can approach questions of logic as questions of how the mind actually thinks, as opposed to um, treating it as a sort of normative mathematical discipline, which is sort of what the mathematical logic people wanted to do. Now, in that uh, debate, Husserl is firmly on the side of the logic people, but um, for even more essential reasons, he just sort of pe thinks people like Frege didn't go far enough in uh, upholding the claims of the, uh, of the logic side of that uh, debate. In a way, he's more Platonist than Frege, if I can put it that way. Um, so he, he, he wants the uh, logic and, and, and math to be telling us essential things about the nature of um, uh, any possible conceptual world, something like that, um, that is completely independent of uh, any, I can put it this way, accidental empirical facts about uh, um, uh, peculiarities of, of human psychology, if I can put it that way. So um, this will you know, come out more later, but to a first approximation, Husserl comes into all this as um, upholding the uh, importance of treating logic and math as things in their own right and not as subsets of psychology. Okay, especially empirical psychology. Um, uh, how does this lead him towards phenomenology? Uh, he basically um, thinks that the, the, the uh, positions that are being discussed here in the first couple of chapters as um, psychologism and naturalism are um, uh, mistakes of the, of the form of getting things the wrong way around in the wrong direction, the wrong order of dependence of one thing on another that he thinks that um, phenomenology can fix. Um, what do we mean by phenomenology here? Uh, something like, uh, if you want to know how you actually think, pay very close attention to your self-thinking, right? Um, and uh, uh, a, a kind of thick description of, uh, of, of, of uh, the acts of consciousness. Um, but that's, that's just a first approximation. But he thinks that there's evidence from the actual experience of, uh, uh, of conscious thought, which can tell you things, essential things about how um, uh, thinking works, the mind works, consciousness works, whatever, that are um, uh, prior to and the basis of all of our later scientific theories. So if someone instead tries to take a la later scientific theory and go back and um, try to explain in a different way how the mind actually works in a way that's different from that, it's going to confuse those levels completely. It's not going to know when it's doing making a logical deduction and when it's referring to an empirical psychological fact, and it won't be able to keep those levels sorted and be able to tell which which thing depended upon which. So, um, from Husserl's point of view, you have to go back to the um, uh, to the base layer and see how how consciousness builds up all of its concepts of the world. Um, okay, so that's just the first approximation of how something like a problem like the foundations of logic can wind up leading you in the direction of something like phenomenology as this. Um, direct inspection of the behavior of consciousness, something like that. Okay, um, so his first big book on that subject was called Logical Investigations, which was written like 1900 to 1901, um, and uh, uh, made a reasonable splash among the circles in Germany that uh, had read it, but that wasn't a very wide circle. Um, uh, later, he had another bigger idea, uh, sorry, bigger book called Ideas, this is this one, um, which is sort of after he had a chance to fully flesh out the thoughts in, in logical investigations and take them farther. Um, and it's sort of, although it's in the middle of his career, it's considered sort of his most um, developed work, so to speak, um, in part because some of his later work, um, he didn't really manage to finish. So uh, later in the 30s, he's working on a book called um, Cartesian Meditations, which is basically uh, trying to ex make some of his, explain some of his, ideas, his thoughts in a, uh, uh, somewhat more coherent form, um, less uh, how he developed them and more, you know, where he comes out in the end, uh, in part by comparing them to Descartes, who is a, a prede predecessor who definitely influenced him in all this, um, uh, I think, consciousness method uh, kind of stuff. So he, 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 uh, his Cartesian meditations are sort of cast as I'm going through and I'm reading Descartes' meditations. I'm going to tell you all the ways in which I agree with him and all the ways I disagree with him, all the things I think he got right, all the things I think he's le he left out. And in that way, you know, you'll see the difference between um, Descartes and me. Uh, the only problem with that 
uh, book is that he didn't quite finish it. <laughs> um, he was still working on it in the 30s. Um, the, the other uh, work that people, there are two other works that people often uh, read with him. One is, uh, read from him rather, um, one is called Philosophy as Rigorous Science, which happens between logical investigations and ideas. Um, it's a short essay, but it's often assigned in philosophy classes. Um, it's sort of his programmatic of um, what we should do next in phenomenology, taking all my ideas out of logical investigations. It's sort of his his uh, um, uh, his manifesto for what uh, phenomenology has to set out and do, um, and uh, conceived as um, putting uh, science on on proper foundations as opposed to assuming the conclusion, which he thinks too much naturalism did. Okay. Anyway, that's like 1910-ish. Um, the other essay that, his, that people typically read is um, uh, the Crisis of the European Sciences. This came, came in the uh, mid-1930s, mid to late 1930s, uh, near the very end of, his, end of his life. It's not quite in a finished form. It was, you know, sort of given as talks about things, uh, and but it didn't like get polished um, because he, he got sick and, and, and died at the end of it. But um, uh, this is a kind of more of a historical um, retrospective. So he's trying to explain where his uh, phenomenology ideas fit in the sort of stream of uh, European thought since the Renaissance, more or less. And he's also a little bit worried about where things are going after him in the sense that he thinks that some of his students are taking things in directions which are less committed to science and enlightenment rationalism than he was um, and this sort of thing. So uh, it's his last work and it's kind of um, uh, worried that people may take phenomenology in a direction that he didn't want to go. So, okay, that's just brief overview of his career. The other things to understand about him is that um, in the course of all that he was uh, one of his most promising student was definitely Heidegger, um, uh, who was working with them in the, in, in the, from the period of logical investigation, well, really period of the um, uh, 1910s, 1920s. By 1920, Heidegger's on doing his own, his own thing. Um, uh, so that's um, basically by the, uh, it means by the time Husserl is doing the ideas, Heidegger is doing his own thing. Um, and there's no question that Heidegger is indebted to, uh, Husserl and Husserl's phenomenology for method, but also um, disagrees with him in one or two essential um, points, right? Some of which uh, Levinas is already alluding to in the course of this book, primarily in terms of how um, theoretical versus practical um, human experience of the life world, so to speak, is. Um, uh, and uh, Heidegger's being in time is famously all about how it's the it's the practical uh, uh, aspects of uh, uh, pre-theoretical life, so to speak, that, that form the structures of the life world. Okay, where structures of life world means something like the um, uh, what are the invariant structures uh, that uh, the conscious that embodied consciousness uh, sees or or or, or has. Um, Husserl was already interested in those, but he was definitely taking at it from from a um, a very theoretical perspective. The, the 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 most important experience from Husserl's point of view is something like. How does the mind understand an external object, right? Um, in a very sort of uh, scientific uh, way that you would get all the way back to, you know, Descartes, Kant, etc. Um, he's much more of an epistemologist, so to speak, um, uh, as opposed to an existentialist. Um, but uh, uh, despite that, they agree on a lot. A lot of the stuff about um, uh, being, being, and the meaning of being that you find in Heidegger is inherited from Husserl. And we'll go over some of that, but if I could uh, put their difference in a in a in a nutshell, it's that Heidegger is much more um, convinced that it's the uh, practical and non-theoretical, non-scientific uh, aspects of the structure of human life that are um, uh, way more important than Husserl thinks they are, so to speak. Um, and maybe also that uh, these things are also more uh, have more of a history, maybe more different from uh, from person to person. But uh, that's a different different issue. Anyway, so so um, Levinas alludes to some of this later in this book, um, but just sketching out some of the differences there. So by 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 late in Husserl's life, he was kind of disappointed in the direction that Heidegger was taking his thought. Thought he was you know taking it in directions that he uh, Husserl wouldn't have taken it. Um, uh, he he didn't think that directions uh, Heidegger was taking it were as uh, rationalist or as committed to, you know, the project of European science that as, uh, as he, Husserl, wished they were. 
And that's sort of what you see in some of his comments in the 30s about that. OK, so who Levinas, meanwhile, is coming in to all of this at the end of the 1920s. So Heidegger has already made a splash with, with being in time. Um, the kind of uh, uh, there's already a, a visible difference between Husserl the teacher and Heidegger the pupil. Um, and people are already seeing that you know uh, Heidegger is not simply going to agree with and, and, and follow in Husserl's program, but is going to do his, kind of his own thing. Uh, Levinas has studied both of them. He studied Husserl longer and Heidegger only for about a year at the time he writes this. Um, although he's also read his books. Um, uh, Levinas is originally from uh, uh, the Baltic states, but he's uh, uh, in France um, uh, speaking French. And he uh, studies in Germany, so he philosophy in Germany with Husserl and, and, and Heidegger. And he writes this for a French audience to explain what's going on in this uh, tradition of philosophy in, in Germany, uh, to explain it to the French, so to speak. Um, and he writes this when he's very young. He's like 24 years old, you know, a, a graduate student in, in, in seminars with uh, Husserl and Heidegger uh, when, he, when, he, when he writes this book. Um, and it's basically Levinas's first work. Levinas himself is active from around the time of this work in like 1930 up until the mid 1970s. Um, and he will have his own ways of, um, he also starts off heavily influenced by Heidegger. And then by late in his life, he will ha have, you know, ways in which he's, you know, strongly disagreeing with Heidegger. So e each of them is having this same kind of relationship to the, to, to the teacher of in their early days, they're heavily indebted to their work and then they go off in a different direction, right? Um, there's a Levinas's own later books. This is probably the single most in, famous one, Totality and Infinity. If you want to know um, all the ways in which he disagrees with Heidegger um, and by his later life, this is the book to read. Um, okay. Uh, uh, and if, uh, if I could put Levinas's disagreement with Heidegger in a, in a nutshell, it would be that he thinks that uh, Heidegger hasn't made the uh, 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 the ethical or the moral central enough to uh, the structure of, uh, of existence, something like that. He thinks that uh, even if he's more practical and less theoretical than uh, uh, Husserl, uh, he, uh, he ethics has dropped out of the picture uh, as far as Levinas is concerned. So in that sense, he's a, a moralizer, uh, Levinas is. Um, uh, okay, so anyway, that's just a little bit of the changes of the three of them. So you have some idea of the span of, the, of this uh, history. Um, they're all in the same tradition, Husserl, Heidegger, and Levinas, right? They're, they're one after another teachers of, the, of, of one another. Um, and each of them is um, following in the same tradition, but having critical points in which they broke with or disagreed with their predecessor. Okay, so um, that's just... Uh, who the sort of three main characters are here. Now, we're not going to talk about Heidegger in this one, because this is just going to be about uh, Levinas talking about Husserl. Um, the only place Heidegger is going to come up is there's some sessions in there where um, uh, the Heideggerian concern that Husserl has downplayed the practical too much um, will be something Levinas also notices and agrees with. But um, that'll be like later on. Uh, OK. So that's just uh, a little bit on the history. Any questions about that before we get into actual first reactions to the reading? Questions about who is who and when and who taught who and so forth? OK. No, I don't have questions on that. But um, I was only able to attend for this time. And I have yeah. to leave. But I, okay. <laughs> I would like to join next time. Yeah, sure. so I'll just keep an eye on your group online. Absolutely. Uh, welcome back. You're welcome Great. back. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Enjoy. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Okay. So uh, first reactions to uh, to the reading then. We'll start with Joe. Uh, I, I was very pleased at uh, where he took me uh, during the first two chapters because I had puzzled over the idea that first that what I had always seen as a dilemma between Descartes' idea of the world in the, in the mind, like mathematics, and how he made his uh, actual hands move, you know, the, the material. Mm -hmm. And I never saw that, and I, I'm interested in discussions about it, but <clears throat> it seems to me that Husserl sort of transcended that, transcended, that's the word that I had to look up, uh, just to make sure that I was actually understanding it in a technical way. 
And I realized that, uh, so he's saying that, yeah, the Kogoto itself, Kogoto is, is itself the thing that we need to investigate. And what is the nature of its being? And suddenly I said, oh yeah, being. Yes, everything, let's talk about this. And then he comes up with the idea that somehow you can make regions of being or segments of being. And now I'm just into it. I want to know more. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Uh, in terms of transcendental, uh, tra transcendent and transcendental, right? Um, uh, it definitely has a technical meaning in Husserl. Um, it's one of those things you got to be intensely careful with because it also had a technical meaning in Kant, which is kind of different. Um, and uh, uh, so, uh, uh, you know, the transcendental analytic of pure reason, right, is, is you know, what pure reason is kind of, kind of about. Um, and uh, uh, so Husserl is borrowing some of the, some of that terminology from the neo-Kantian tradition and therefore using it in a semi-Kantian way, but he's not using it in exactly the Kantian way. And Kant would not, you know, um, if you, uh, if you read someone like um, uh, Stanley Rosen, by the way, there's a good section on Husserl in this book, uh, The Elusiveness of the Ordinary by uh, Stanley Rosen. Um, uh, he will, you know, uh, carefully warn you, you know, uh, Kant, when Kant says transcendental, he means X. And when Husserl says transcendental, he means not X. <laughs> um, that they're not just using it in the same term. Um, but okay, so the, 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 to a first approximation, uh, transcendent for, uh, Husserl means transcendent of the consciousness to the consciousness, put it this way. It's what the consciousness understands as being uh, beyond just the consciousness, right? So uh, for, 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 um, for Husserl, right, when you perceive the table, right, and you, uh, you you may have um, sense impressions about you know the the shape and color of the table and uh, uh, and so forth, but the the table that you're reacting to is in the intentions of your thoughts, meant to be outside of the stream of your experience. It's meant to be, be beyond you in a real world outside your mind, right? So you would say that as he would say that as the intentional object of your consciousness is a transcendent object. Right, transcendent of your experience, meaning you're trying to, to be thinking about the sense you're giving to the to the uh, concepts you're employing, right? To be, to be logical about it, is of something that isn't just a piece of your mind, right? And I'm positing it. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. But the the the, uh, the 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 critical thing that makes like Husserl not a Hegelian, right? Is that Husserl will say. Uh, that because that's what you're intending, that's the actual meaning of that table. That table is not a collection of thoughts. That table is not a collection of uh, uh, um, colors appearing to your mind, like it might be to a British empiricist. It's not even a fact about a bunch of those uh, 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 colors appearing to your mind, right? It is, as an, in as an intentional object of your consciousness, meant to be something outside your mind that is real, so here's the critical part that makes him a phenomenologist. That's what it is. Because according to his logical investigations, to um, try to refer to things in ways which are not the sense, in the purely logical sense, uh, the sense or semantics or meaning that was attached to that term when you started reasoning about it is to be absurd. Right? If you're going to talk about dogs, you have to about talk about the thing which is meant to be the mental reference of dogs. You can't talk about gods viewed from the uh, from the back. Right? You're not referring to the word. You're not referring to some uh, you know uh, other thing like the symbol. Right? You're trying to refer to actual dogs. And if you don't use language in that way, you will be unable to discourse, so to speak. So this is just a point in logic. The 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 sense that you give to your terms has to be uh, strictly adhered to in later reasoning about them, or you're not even talking about the same thing and you cannot reason. Okay. So that being the case, if what your mind tries to mean by the table is a transcendent object outside of your consciousness, then that's what the table is. And this is not 
something which is guaranteed by a uh, truth of psychology or an empirical fact. It is guaranteed by what he would call an, an adidic or an idea-like uh, uh, fact about how logic ascribes senses to terms in order to reason about them, right? The table is the sense you give to table in your internal reasonings about it. That's all it, that's where it came from. That's how you're using it. If you deviate from that, you're not talking about a table. If you're, if you're trying to say the table that you experience doesn't exist, you could have a different uh, conversation about that. But the table that you're trying to talk about is the one that your uh, mind intended when it uh, created this sort of um, uh, intentional, uh, intentional unity of ob external object of my perceptions, right? It's the actual table there in front of you, outside your mind, what you meant by table. Therefore, because of what you meant by table, that's what table is, right? Now, any of your empirical propositions about that table might wind up being wrong, but the fact that the meaning you're giving to the table term is that thing, that's um, uh, apodictic from his point of view. It's something where you've laid it down as a definition. Objecting to it is like objecting to the definition of a compact set in an analysis. It's just out of court. You're, you're in effect, effectively not allowed to object to the way that m the mind has assigned meanings to the terms about which it is reasoning. You're allowed to object about whether or not the reasonings it made about them are sound or whether or not the, you know, they comport with you know, some other experience, but that I, mean, you know, uh, that I mean that thing up there in the sky by the evening star, right, is something I'm just allowed to do in order to be able to ascribe sense to things in order to be, begin reasoning about them. And you're not allowed to sever that link, right? Okay. So, uh, and that to him is part where well, you can see how this is related to his objections to um, uh, psychologism in logic, right? The 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 um, ability of the mind to ascribe sense to things as it actually means them is sort of a kind of a sovereign power of reason, right? Um, Okay, so uh, having said that, the next thing you ask is, um, well then, what are the different layers of these things? We obviously have these kind of intentional objects of our consciousness, right? To him, those are the things which we call the transcendent things. The transcendent things are the things that we intend to be objects outside of our mind. Contrast that with the imminent the opposite of the transcendent is the imminent in this regard. Imminent means the things that I intend to be just interior facts about my uh, interior facts about my stream of consciousness, right? My moods, my feelings, uh, the particular uh, uh, pulsation of the color green uh, uh, coming from that thing over there, whatever. Uh, the, the, the things which the British empiricists would call the, uh, the qualia, not as something transmitted to my mind from outside, but as things which I am subjectively experiencing, right? All of those are to Husserl part of what he would call the, the imminent layer of consciousness, right? They, the, the mind experiences them, we think of them, the consciousness experiences them as interior to us. They're not designed to be about the external world. They're certainly designed to convey information to us about the external world, but you don't think of, you know, uh, your passing sense of perception of, of, of time as being in the room like the table is, right? You experience it as part of the interior of your consciousness. Okay, so first distinction, imminent, transcendent, transcendent, leave aside whether it is or not, your mind wants it to have the sense of it's, out, it's outside of the consciousness. That's what transcendent means to first approximation to Husserl. Okay, so, uh, and that's different from what it might mean to um, Kant, for example, although there are points of similarity. Um, okay, but first thing, the thing that the transcendent is transcending is consciousness. Okay. Um, all right, and then we can, we can talk about how some of these things are related to what later gets called intuition. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, we're not going to try to get this whole theory of intuition before we got into everybody's first reactions. Um, 
uh, I hope that helped on, on what transcendent is. The other critical thing that we, uh, I don't know that uh, Levinas even harps on it enough, but is the, um, uh, the most characteristic thing in Husserl is the absolute existence of consciousness. Um, for for uh, uh, Husserl, um, that, con that the consciousness exists is not a deduction, although that the, uh, that the existence of the consciousness is absolute in the sense that the consciousness is absolutely posited, right? Um, is to him a uh, something that we can discover in the course of phenomenology, right, or, or phenomenological investigation. But the the compared to um, some other schools of thought, right? You can say that sort of it's not it's not quite fair to say that's where he begins. But um, uh, the consciousness exists absolutely. It doesn't exist like the table exists. It exists more absolutely than that. We have the evidence for its existence more immediately than we have the evidence for the existence of the table. We have evidence for the existence of consciousness, which is not something which follows from a definition like two plus two being equal to four. It's not something which is contained in the concept or analytic in that sense. It is a, it is a truth of fact, not of logic, but it is a truth of fact for which we have, um, which is more evident to us than anything else can ever possibly be. Something like that. Go, Joe. Uh, yeah. Uh, did Heidegger carry that uh, uh, implicit uh, view of consciousness into his being and time uh, philosophy? Because when the sign is thrown into whatever, does it, it sort of brings consciousness with it, does it not? Oh, so I mean, uh, consciousness is really uh, 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 Husserl's term for his base layer of reality that winds up becoming instead Dasein in Heidegger. Heidegger is using Dasein or existence for that term because he does not want to restrict it to consciousness in Husserl's sense. He thinks that ha consciousness in Husserl's sense is sort of too front of the mind mental uh, uh, a, a view of it, uh, doesn't include enough that's mood-like, et cetera, maybe. Um, but yes, consciousness for Husserl and, and Dasein for Heidegger are very closely related concepts, right? Um, uh, yeah, but the, the, uh, um, the critical things for Husserl about consciousness are that it exists in absolute position. What he means by that is that uh, there is no, uh, no conceivable mind that can deny the existence of consciousness uh, sensibly, without being irrational, right? Um, it, but it is a truth of fact, not a truth that follows from a definition. It's not an ontological kind of argument, right? That there must be a consciousness, something like that, right? It's not necessary existence in that sense. Um, but to speak Heidegger, uh, the consciousness always already exists, something like that. Um, which doesn't mean the consciousness is infinite. It means something more like um, all thought presupposes something like the, uh, the, 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 the structure of a transcendental ego, something like that to speak Kant. Okay, so absolute existence of consciousness and transcendent means what transcends the consciousness, imminent means in the interior of consciousness or to consciousness in the interior of consciousness. Okay. The extra critical thing I want to get to before we get to first reactions is this is another critical term, which we're going to be getting to, especially uh, in chapter three, but um, is intention and intentionality, right? The critical thing there is um, this is part of this respecting what the mind actually does in ascriptions of sense, right? Um, uh, the claim is that the consciousness performs acts of intention uh, later thinkers would say, uh, we orient on objects, right? The objects are already, th are actually there when we orient on them, right? Um, but another way of putting this is, um, uh, to Husserl, um, thought is always thought about something, interior, exterior. Um, there is always an intention 
and an intended object uh, of, of, of thoughts, uh, of the contents of thoughts. There's something that thought is trying to be about, right? It might miss, but there's something that it's trying to be about, right? And that trying to be about and the conferring of sense upon things are to Husserl um, uh, so linked that they're on, almost synonymous, right? Um, you, you might be trying to think about an empirical thing and discover that it wasn't the empirical thing you were thinking about, right? You think that as a man in the distance, you get a little bit closer and you discover that it was a tree, whatever, right? But the, the, the object you were trying to think about is still whatever that object was over there that had the characteristics that made you classify it a certain way. When you get up to it close enough to see that it is a tree, it's not that the object uh, that you were trying to think about has changed from trying to think about men to trying to think about trees. You're trying to think about the same object. You just know something different about it, right? The actual object you were trying to think about is the transcendent over your mind outside of your consciousness thing that you were trying to have the, have your thoughts about. Okay. Um, and this is going to be related to um, questions of being and differences of the sense of being in different regions and what regions are. But fundamentally, we've got this absolute existing consciousness, imminent transcendent. And another way of putting this intentional bit is that um, the uh, to speak later cognitive sci science, right? The, the, the consciousness intends to be thinking about things outside of itself. So it is, right? From the standpoint of a, uh, of a Berkeleyan idealist, um, this is the claim that the consciousness has windows in it, always already. In Heideggerian terms, this is the same as saying the, the, the consciousness is all, always already plugged into the world outside, right? It's not stuck inside itself, right? Uh, it has in, intentions to reach transcendent objects and does, right? You're trying to think about an external world. You are thinking about an external world. What you're thinking about it in terms of your thoughts about it may be constituted in thought, but precisely what they're trying to think about is something transcendent of consciousness itself. Okay, so that's this sort of fundamental phenomenological move that tries to get rid of the previous subject object distinction that you had of the Berkeley and uh, early moderns or of the tradition of British empiricism that you find in like people like Locke and, uh, and Hume and the skepticism that results from all that because um, Husserl does not think that the consciousness is locked up inside the head. He will object strenuously over and over again to the idea that uh, the relationship between uh, um, the real world and consciousness is that consciousness is contained inside the real world like, an, uh, like a, a cookie is in a cookie tin, right? The, the physical containment of one thing by another is not the appropriate model for the relationship between consciousness and the world of which it is conscious. It is not one of container and contained or of inside and outside, right? This is the point that Heidegger also makes strenuously in being in time um, when he talks about the uh, the Dasein always uh, being before the beings, so to speak. Um, okay. Uh, anyway, some of those some of those fundamental things of sort of structure of Husserl's ontology. Just want to get out there. A part of this is all just prompted by you bringing up the word transcendental and you having to look it up to see how it's what it means, right? Uh, there's different things that can mean in different philosophies. Okay. I want to give Craig a chance to have his first reactions to uh, the reading and then anything I was just saying. <laughs> Um, kind of following on some of the same things there, getting getting used to his uh, his his structure and and getting used to his his things. A couple things I highlighted, um, page twenty one, where he says the uh, the flux of consciousness cannot be made of pure actuality. Um, so uh, so it's always they always need to be surrounded by a sphere of inactuality. Uh, that one I'm I'm still. Yeah. struggling a little bit with what he means by actuality and inactuality. So that falls right. a little bit on the same sense. So I don't know if you want to cover, I, I cover could all of them or just... I could definitely address that one quickly. I mean, there, there's definitely more you can go back to there, but the the um, what he's trying to get out there is that um, uh, 
in all of the mind's intended objects, they are there are potentialities around them, right? We're thinking of objects as things which can do X or could be Y, right? There may be something that we're thinking of them as actual or, or as actual about them, but we're always surrounding them with possibility spaces, so to speak. Um, and those are always more or less fuzzy, right? So it's not like you just have uh, a, a a photocopy of a single external reality, right? You have um, um, uh, a, a uh, things surrounded by potentialities. He gives the examples of the of the um, the table, right? The perfect example of this is is the you're, you're, you're you know he talks about um, you're looking at one side of a table, right? The table itself that you mean is not the image of the table that you can see right now, right? Uh, the actual intended object of your thought, the current actual object of your thought is this side of the table presenting itself to you. But that side of the table presenting itself to you is not a piece of uh, impression in your senses. It's meant to be something outside of you, but you're only looking at one side of it and you could keep walking around it and it would still be there to five minutes from now, right? And the actual object you're intending, the transcendent object you're intending has all of these possible experiences behind it, right? It has a persistence through time of a bunch of characteristics. It doesn't just have one side, even though you only ever see one side because it's spatial, right? So the actual intended object there is something which is bigger than your experiences of it. It includes some of your possible experiences of it as the thing that you're intending by it. It's a kind of equivalence class over a giant set of experiences, real and, uh, uh, real and possible or actual and possible, right? So when you think of the table, right, you're thinking of something which is going to last long enough to be table-like that will be there as you walk around it, right, that will have, you know, a, a, not only a color, but a, you know, a hardness which you, if you wrap on it, and all of those different things which you're prescribing to it or, or supposing about it, right, are uh, elements of the thing that you're intending to be thinking about, right? It's not just a set of a few impressions in your consciousness that are that have been actual in the recent past that are the basis of the intended table the intended table is putting together a whole bunch of potential too so that's when he says the flux of consciousness cannot be made from pure actuality his point being it's always including all of these other potentials that it's organizing too potentials as things which could happen potentials as things that could be experienced how the table would look if i moved you know six inches to the left Right. Some of those are experiments you've made. Some of them are things you're just remembering. Some of them are things which you uh, you just you know uh, imagine you could do. Others are things you're going to do two minutes from now. Right. All of those things are other than and in a sense bigger than just the um, British empiricist view that it's a single snapshot frame of a movie of this side of the table right now. Right. And the the, the point is that the the uh, the contents of consciousness are always bigger in that um, fuzzier and including lots of possibilities around them way um, because, the, because the objects of experience are uh, not simply uh, uh, little subsets of imminent, uh, exper uh, Im imminent experiences. The table I'm intending is not, you know, the, the, the this this region of, of space in this color for the last three seconds. That's not what I mean by the table, right? I'm always meaning something uh, uh, bigger and more involved in that. So he, the way he, he puts it is that the, um, um, the, the, the transcendent object is an intentional unity of a, uh, that is organizing a whole bunch of eminent perceptions, right? So it is not, reducible to just a small snippet of those imminent perceptions. This is kind of an argument against some of the positivists who are trying to turn, you know, what the object means to me into the, you know, the last four frames of what I saw of it. No, that's confusing your evidence for the object with the object, right? Your evidence for the object and the object are two different things. The object you're thinking about is whatever you intend to give the sense to and you're thinking about it. And that's always bigger than just a few imminent experiences. Does that help? Yeah, that helps. A couple couple threads on that that I'm gonna pull on because it's going a little bit outside of 
specifics of this book. Um, reading, uh, current reading on theories of anticipation mm -hmm. and, uh, and how that plays in. And yep. also some readings on intentionality being related to what is necessary for life and bringing back final thoughts into the argument. And uh, so I'm, I'm going to be trying to draw the thread from how Husserl starts opening that door and, uh, and the fact that the door is still open to anticipation, uh, reintroducing final cause and uh, definitions of living uh, what life is in that we see possibilities, we anticipate possibilities, we act on uh, possibilities as much as, as anything else. So yes. that's the thread I'm kind of tugging at in the broader picture of where I'm where I'm yep. taking myself right now. And 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 uh, uh, you're you're right to could be going in that direction. It's one of the directions of phenomenology went. Heidegger especially went in that direction of the projection onto your possibilities for your own existence as being the place that the Dasein you know develops its meaning for things, right? Um, uh, so it's you know it's the, uh, the 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 time ecstasies of Dasein, which are you know it, it's it's real possibilities of what it's always contemplating that are sort of motivating. It's always a motivated consciousness. It's motivated by the uh, its actual possibilities of realization in this practical sense, right? That's not there yet in Husserl. What is there in Husserl is the sort of theoretical correlates of that, if I can put it that way, when he talks about um, uh, property of the world of things. Uh, uh, is this possibility of going back to the same thing and re-identifying it, that there is uh, this, the need for the thing to be persistent is the same as saying that uh, it is revisitable. So that's an example of one of those possibilities from uh, uh, the theoretical one of those possibilities from uh, Heidegger's point of view. To, to Husserl, uh, um, something like that, um, uh, uh, time extension and uh, perceptive, per, per, uh, perceptual, multi, uh, multifacetedness, something like that, is more essential to him than the practical, than the practical action meanings, so to speak. Um, the, uh, for, for Husserl, it's enough that you could imagine uh, contemplating the thing five minutes from now, right? Um, he, he's, he's much more theoretically oriented that way. The other thing I'll say is that um, um, plenty of people in sort of native cognitive uh, uh, science um, were, you know, heavily, uh, very interested in the stuff the phenomenologists found out, right, or, or we're thinking of, right, and are interested in understanding, uh, if I go to this way, the machinery of perception according to things which the phenomenologists in that school, you know, discovered. But that's all very much against the grain of what Husserl himself is trying to do, because Husserl himself is trying to say, you don't want to try to explain how you think from what you know from your physical theories about, you know, uh, uh, animals and 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 uh, and and so forth. He's trying to do it the other way around, right? He's he's an anti-positivist in this regard, right? He's not trying to explain the mind as a machine. He's trying to explain uh, thinking, including thinking about uh, your uh, mechanical physical theories, as being based upon a prior consciousness thought-like. Um, meta structure, right? He, he wants you to recognize the logic and mathematics in everything that you're trying to think about uh, uh, your scientific theories more than he wants you to have scientific theories about how you think, right? He thinks it's backwards to try to have scientific theories about how you think that aren't themselves logical and mathematical theories. Um, uh, you, you have to start from the logical and mathematical. Um, so we'll get into the naturalism problem. The, the fundamental uh, uh, beef that he has with both psychologism in logic and naturalism in philosophy more generally, and with the positivists of his era and the um, and the British empiricists of the Lockean variety, you know, older, is that um, they have uh, uh, taken a set of um, deductions they have about the sphere of material things, and they have assumed that it is true of all beings as such and then misapplied it to everything else. And the everything else includes all the other regions of being. Um, and the easiest way of seeing this is to think of the least controversial one of those other regions of being. There could be others of them which are much more controversial than this, but one of them is just mathematics. 
nobody thinks the a there exists question in mathematics is the same as a you know is there one in physics right existence means something different in the realm of mathematics than it means the realm of physics You're making different kinds of claims about different things okay so uh when he talks about regions of being right one of the regions he'd being would be mathematical truth logic he would go farther music right there's all kinds of things which are uh more of the aesthetic or more of the quality uh, side of things uh which again he'll say you're not going to understand those properly if you try to understand them as uh using a ontology method and mode of reasoning and sense of what being means that you got from mechanics and nowhere else right he'll even say if you try to understand biology from nothing but mechanics you're not going to get you're not it's not going to work um let alone if you try to understand culture or psychology from just mechanics right so th when he talks about there being regional ontologies in different regions of being uh what he's getting at is that um the things that the mind is trying to think about and trying to reason out and ascribing sense to in its own experiences are different in these different uh uh types of thoughts so to speak these different kinds of thoughts and uh none of them gets to imperialize over all the others and say that this is what reality actually is um well not quite true reality can be a technical term for one of these things if you want right um where it means re-like things which are like things you know like 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 that thing that the latins called res right if you want that to be one of your regions fine but uh as long as you recognize that uh um uh, elliptic functions are not in that space elliptic functions are not in the res like right uh nor is biology um okay uh okay so that's where a little bit where he's going with the with uh the regional ontology stuff but on this uh uh explanations of consciousness so uh he wants to explain consciousness as much as possible from the inside and faithful to how it seems to work itself and wants to work itself so to speak intends to work itself um whereas a uh a a lockean uh uh british empiricist might think that uh the fact that you think something is no evidence at all that that is sensible um uh Husserl says uh all the evidence you have for anything uh comes from that right if you throw if you throw that out you're not going to have evidence of anything else left right um so uh, uh to be evident is always going to be anchored in evidentiary experiences in thought so uh yeah okay uh there's another uh, wonderful line that tries to illustrate this in uh, in ideas. Uh, this may be a little bit a little bit of a stretch about how far it is to uh, to get it, but um, uh, uh, when he claims that an absolute reality is no more or less valid than a round square, what does he? Why does he say that? Um, absolute is trying to say something like. Um, uh, uh immediate um uh, and uh, certain and um uh in no way contingent something like that um as he's using it here and for him that leads to propositions like uh the absolute existence of consciousness right but reality means what's thing like right what reminds us of the attributes of uh transcendent things as you know uh, um, uh, intentional objects outside the mind right that's why he says absolute reality is a round square reality and world are headings for certain valid unities of sense related to certain connections of the absolute pure consciousness in other words because what all the things you're calling real actually are is unities of sense created by your consciousness part of the concept real is that it is derivative all your real thoughts are about transcendent things outside your consciousness intended by your consciousness that are derivative constructions in that sense you're when you say absolute reality you're trying to say 
an immediate and completely unhypothetical artificial construction of my consciousness. Contradiction, right? So the, the point is uh, reality points in the direction of a constructed unity of sense. That's what that word points towards. An absolute or immediate points to a, something like a imminent flow of my consciousness to which I have absolute evidence. And his claim is those two will never coincide, right? Um, okay, so, uh, but he puts that in this paradoxical form, absolute reality is a round square, right? All realities are always constructions. To be real-like is to be put together from a wide variety of other experiences as an intentional unity that makes sense of them. It's always theoretical in that sense. A lot of this work is actually in terms of levels of reality and such as that is exactly. looking for structures that are guides, uh, but but they're they're not absolute in any sense. They're 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 guides to help us get through the mess. Yes, and and from his point of view, the things which are absolute are when he says absolute, he just means the base layer of evidence. The base layer of evidence, uh, the base layer of eminent evidence can be called absolute in the sense that all the other theories have to wrestle with, contend with, and uh, uh, you know, try to explain or be falsified by it, right? But only that base layer of you know, absolute experience, immediate experience, imminent experience counts as absolute, right? And everything else is uh, uh, inside a theory, right? And the, the, the fundamental method of phenomenology from his point of view is to watch yourself thinking and pay attention to what you're doing while, and here's the critical part, suspending belief in everything you think you know because of a theory, right? Anything you think you've learned from some, you know, really involved, you know, a, 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 a hack tower of constructions of a theory, right? Suspend what you think you know about that while you're watching how you think about something, right? Then you'll know how you actually think about that thing. If you try to, exp if you're, if you're, if you're assuming a whole bunch of things, which are the conclusions of giant theories that you haven't really established yet, right? Um, then you're, you're, you're going to be thinking backwards, and you're going to confuse all these levels, right? Whereas if you let the uh, elaborate later constructed theories be made out of your earlier concepts, you will have things in the right order, the order in which you actually think about them, and therefore you won't falsify your actual internal processes of thought. And this is the error he sees the, logic the, the psychologists in logic and the uh, uh, aggressive positivists in psychology, so to speak, as making. Right. Okay. So, and this is something which definitely cut against against the grain of thinking at his time, and still runs cuts against the grain of a lot of um, contemporary um, uh, naturalistic cognitive science kind of thinking. Right. Where we think that if I've got a scientific theory of X, it has to inform me about everything I know about this uh, this philosophical uh, uh, thought here. Right. And we're always looking for connections between this thing I saw in philosophy and this thing I learned in biology class and so forth. And he's like, no, don't do that. Don't try to have what you learn in physics um, change what you think is meant in a mathematical analysis class. Right. Do the mathematical analysis class as a mathematical analysis class. And if you understand the mathematical analysis as pure math well, then you'll do well in physics because it's applying it. But if you try to do it the other way, if you try to uh, uh, learn the theory of elliptic functions from, uh, from how, uh, uh, how things worked in your physics lab, right? he thinks you're going to mess it up. Now, uh, that's debatable as an empirical matter, or even in that kind of example. But he, he wants you to think from the uh, from the uh, put it this way the logical uh, the logical infrastructure forward, instead of from the um, most elaborate uh, empirical science back. You can put it that way. Okay. Uh, I, I 
find it interesting and it's just a little brief aside on that. Um, a lady that was in my physics class who later became my wife uh, chastised me one time in class when I said, use your intuition. And she yes. said, our intuition uh, as new physics students is not your intuition as a physics uh, professor because you have a lot more contained within what you say is your intuition. Yes. And I found it to be an interesting little way of looking at it because there's sort of a developmental aspect in this. The uh, reality to a child and the reality to a teenager, the reality to an adult and the reality to a philosopher, uh, that's part of the change over time that, that all of us experience is our, is our bags of experience grow in a sense too. So. Yeah. Yes. And it, when, if it's bags of experience and even bags of logical thoughts about your experiences or, you know, intuitions informed by your experiences, um, Husserl will be all in favor of it. If it's not your experiences, but somebody else's theory, that's where he's worried. When you're not, oh, yeah. when you're not experiencing it yourself, and you're assuming that it has to work a certain way because somebody else has a theory about it that you have never examined from end to end, right? He's worried that that's when you're going to uh, fool yourself about what is actually going on or how you're actually thinking about things or uh, get your categories backwards. So if, if, if John's, it, sorry. As a challenge to education as, an, as a process, isn't it? Sure. Book learning, yeah, sure. a real challenge to to our whole method of education. Sure. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, so, so, I mean, his paradigm example, this would probably be something like, you know, John Stuart Mill telling you that the uh, uh, logic uh, teaches us the laws of thought about how human beings actually think in terms of uh, the way in which, you know, one chain of uh, internal representations of things is succeeded by another. That's sort of the the, the the classic, you know, uh, British empiricist, uh, uh, you know, uh, turned turned utilitarian of the mid 19th century uh, explanation of what logic is in in Mill, right? And Husserl is like, no, that completely misses the point about what logic is, right? Logic is a normative science about how you sh about how you should think if you're thinking clearly. It's a math it's an entire mathematical discipline. It doesn't tell you anything at all about how you uh, about how the man on the street uh, will, will, will typically have one idea succeed another, which may have nothing to do with the laws of logic, right? Um, and uh, yeah, if you go looking for valid inferences by uh, by the process of uh, asking a uh, hundred uh, British empiricists how they thought uh, what they thought was connected, one thought after another, right? You're, you're not going to result in, you're not going to get a, uh, you're not going to get Frege's answer. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, okay. So, so, uh, and, and the reason from his point of view, that Husserl's point of view, that, that Mill could have that notion is he thinks that to be uh, scientific, to be empirical and to be, um, he thinks that to be scientific and, and empirical is to be rational. Right. And, uh, therefore, um, any any thought which is as informed as possible by the most uh, uh, up-to-date empirical theory is likely to be the most accurate. That's the sort of the, the, the general um, uh, naturalist, I go to this way, uh, uh, tendency or, or um, tide of the uh, of the 19th century down to positivist movement that he's reacting to. Okay. Um, I think we covered the absoluteness of consciousness. Um, I don't want to go to the translator forward because like you, I don't like the translator. I, I tried to tell you guys to start with the, um, the, the Levinas introduction. Even then, the Levinas introduction has uh, a bunch of things in it which uh, are kind of like throat clearing and you know, answering objections from people who aren't here, right? And things like that. Um, he, he could have started his introduction with, we would like to study the present Study and present Husserl's philosophy as one studies and presents a living philosophy. He could have started there. Um, uh, right. 
Okay, so then then on uh, the most useful thing probably is, as you said, that the, the other things which are possible in the 19th century he was talking about. This is on page uh, LVII. Um, talks about how influence of Hegel's system was neutralized by the progress of natural science and history. And his point was that at that point, um, people basically thought that philosophy is without an object and philosophy, the only thing left for philosophy to explain is the theory of knowledge. And the two dominant positions in theory of knowledge were um, psychologism, as we'll talk about in a second, um, which is something like um, the empirical science of how people think is what uh, uh, the theory of knowledge should be. Um, so, uh, and that psychology should be um, pursued with the methods of chemistry, basically. Um, uh, and on the other hand, you had a kind of neo-Kantian school, which was trying to understand uh, in a uh, vaguely Kantian way, uh, the conditions of uh, possible experience as, uh, you know, how does, how does uh, they understood sort of Kantian critique as the, uh, or the conditions of possible experience, logical conditions of possible experience as being something like um, how knowledge is possible in the sense of how uh, creatures like us might have a form of understanding that would be, you know, vaguely trustworthy in these specific areas, something like that. So that, that version of theory of knowledge in the neo-Kantian tradition. And the, the, so from Husserl's point of view, when he's starting his work, those are kind of the, the two dominant uh, views of what philosophy is. And both of them are very narrow cramped views of what philosophy is. Both of them think that most knowledge, the, the, the classical, uh, classical formulation of positivism at this period is that positivism is the theory that all, all genuine knowledge is scientific knowledge. And philosophy isn't a science, so there's no philosophical knowledge, right? That's sort of the the only philosoph the only philosophical knowledge in uh, in philosophy is logic. That's sort of the typical sort of positivist position of the around this time. And then the then the uh, psychologists in logic come in and say, well, actually, um, if you had a normative logic, it would be uh, a, a pie in the sky fantasy. And for it to be a, uh, a, a truly scientific logic, it would have to be a, a rigorously empirical and predictive um, uh, empirical psychology, right? Which should replace logic, right? The, how people actually think as opposed to how they should think. So uh, that was in a way threatening to get rid of the last uh, 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 rational discipline left to uh, uh, philosophy and reduce it to uh, just the, uh, actually, philosophy departments can just shut down. They've been completely replaced by science departments, right? Even the logic part. Um, so uh, that's sort of the positivist program at the end of the end, end of the 19th century, uh, slightly made a slight caricature of, right? Um, and so uh, from all that, he thinks all that is way too narrow a view of the importance of philosophy and also is... Um, uh, a whole lot of unjustified imp imperialism on the part of a very uh, narrow, misconstrued understanding of science, something like that. And so the, the place where he opens the counterattack is logic, but he's going to extend it to naturalism as such. All right, so I think we've covered a little bit about what is meant by psychologism in, in logic. Um, uh, we now have to get to what he means by naturalism. Because by naturalism, he does not mean natural science. He means something more, much more like this positivist uh, uh, caricature. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So the way that uh, Levinas puts this on page nine is um, the scientist is, is, uh, is mistaken as soon as he tries in his own way to interpret what he is doing. Naturalism seems to be only a bad interpretation of the meaning of natural science. So the, the, the point is that um, uh, what natural science is doing is perfectly sensible. It is following its uh, uh, 
uh, natural sort of pre-scientific intuitions of uh, uh, what the uh, intended objects of, of its thought are, and it's trying to uh, reason about them the same way it, it reasons about uh, objects, and it's you know uh, uh, thinking abstractly about them because abstract thinking and thinking coincide, and it's thinking logically about them, um, and it wants to discover the um, uh, apparently necessary uh, deterministic laws in the areas that it investigates. All perfectly sensible, all perfectly rational, right? Husserl's all for it. Um, no problem with any of that at all. But as soon as we get to the point where um, uh, science decides, not science, some, some naturalism decides that it has to eliminate all secondary qualities, that is eliminating the merely subjective in the appearance while retaining the primary qualities, and that this will enable the thought to be exact and scientific, then Husserl is already beginning to bristle. If you ex eliminate everything subjective in the experience, you have eliminated the experience. You have eliminated the evidence. You have eliminated the data, right? So what is actually going on there is that the, uh, the physicist has a theory of extended being, of you know, uh, uh, material being as uh, extended objects in space, which is based upon a you know an intuition of the form of space, just like you had in Kant, right? And is based upon an entire um, um, purely logical, uh, uh, purely idea-like science of the nature of space, which is geometry and mathematical analysis, right? And it's trying to use uh, those to explain. Uh, the nature of material spatial being in the uh, intuited external natural world. Great. Um, none of that means that those categories exhaust either the natural world or the world. Properly understood, all that just means that when you're thinking about something insofar as it is an extended material being in space to which you can apply geometry and analysis, that's what you're doing. And yes, geometry and analysis has to abstract from everything for which geometry and analysis has no categories, right? But that's all you're doing. It's not that there's nothing else there. It's not even that there's nothing else there that you experience or have evidence of. There's tons of other things you, uh, there that you, uh, experience and have evidence of. You just don't have any way of dealing with them geometrically or uh, or uh, by the methods of mathematical analysis. So if you want to use those methods to apply to this region of experience, right, you have to drop them. It's a pure dropping narrowing to leave them out. It doesn't mean they're not there. It just means you don't have a method for considering them inside physics, right? So uh, the, 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 the proper interpretation of the meaning of that piece of natural science, if you're watching what you're doing while you're doing it, is I can only reason about um, uh, the extended material beings here as the intended extended material beings. I, I, I had that classification of the of the of the narrowness of the scope of what I was going to consider, and that's what selected the methods that I'm using to consider them. Okay, um, but none of that means that any of these any of the things which those uh, leave out aren't real, right, or aren't actual. Okay, and that's what he sees. The um, that's what he sees. The uh, naturalism as tending to do, right? Uh, this is on page 11, where he says, the naturalist sees only nature and primarily physical nature. Whatever is, is either itself physical, belonging to the unified totality of physical nature, or if it is in fact psychical, uh, only as a variable dependent on the physical, at best a secondary parallel accompaniment. His point being that the only evidence that the if I can put it this way, the naturalist, uh, uh, the naturalist theory of, of psychology as a epiphenomena on the, uh, on the material bangings together of atoms in the mind, right? If I can put it that way, 
Um, the only evidence that that has is the narrowness of the original pro uh, projection of the area of being that was being considered, right? It's not like the psychologist or the physicist has any actual evidence that the mind is a purely material thing, that consciousness is a purely material thing, that the way to understand it is with the methods of physics describing how atoms are colliding inside the, inside the skull, right? He doesn't have any evidence of that whatsoever. The only thing he has suggesting that idea to him is a prior projection that has narrowed the sphere, the meaning of being in the sphere he's thinking of down to physical nature, right? If he had watched himself doing that narrowing while he was doing it, he would know where that narrowing was coming from. And he would not think that he could deduce more from it than he can. So, <clears throat> so the, the point at which this is all being written, including even Levinas's work on that, is sort of a pre-quantum uh, mechanical, mechanistic view which then everybody who is dealing with the quantum world trying to make sense of it was trying to impose on it to a great extent. Um, I mean, uh, to be fair, uh, some of that stuff is contemporary with the time of um, uh, Heidegger and uh, later Levinas, but it was it was certainly news to them. I mean, uh, uh, Heidegger was famously friends with Heisenberg at the same university, right? Um, so uh, they, they, they were thinking about these things. Uh, Levinas was not thinking about that in particular, but he was definitely thinking also about uh, relativity in the uh, Einsteinian sense, right? Um, so, uh, and some of that informs some of the stuff he talks about, about the, uh, um, the um, uh, understanding of, the, of spatial being, so to speak. Um, but, uh, uh, what I'm trying to say, the, the, um, it's not, it wasn't, this was not just an objection to a particularly narrow understanding of, of material nature, right? It was an objection to the attempt to understand all spheres of experience as being uh, contained within material nature or trying to think of material nature as the highest genus, right? The claim is simply that there is zero evidence for this proposition, zero. The only reason that people think that they have evidence for it is that they have deliberately narrowed their field of view and haven't noticed that that's what they were doing, right? Okay, um, so this is where we get to what do we mean by being? Okay, so uh, from uh, from uh, Husserl's point of view, um, the world is something like a a a, a totality or unity uh, uh, constructed out of all of our experiences of anything we regard as transcendent, but the being of the world and of things in the world is something which is ascribed to them as meanings by consciousness. So he's distinguishing between uh, the world or even transcendent objects and their being. And what he means by their being is something like their sense as intended by consciousness, right? So if I if I mean if if the 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 external table, uh, the table I'm contemplating, right, is meant to be a transcendent object outside my mind that I have you know that that, that unifies a bunch of my experiences and explains them, but it's not it's not a bunch of my experiences. It's not even an explanation for a bunch of my experiences. It's the actual external thing that I'm attempting to refer to that I'm attempting to use to explain those experiences. Right? It is that intentional unity as external transcendent of, of my consciousness extended thing. Okay. That's what I meant by it. So it's being is as an extended thing to me. Right? 
all, all, all it's, go it's going to inherit all of the um, conceptual structure in the overall thought structure of uh, my uh, life experience of my experience of external extended things, right? It didn't get that from an empirical fact of nature. It got that from how I divided up experience into regions of being, regions of meaning to me, right? The, the, uh, this is the, this is where he's getting into this uh, uh, being or existence, meaning different things in different regions, right? To, to, be, in, to be a physical thing in material nature, uh, you have to be extended, you have to be experiential by, ex, at least in principle, exper experienceable by perception of some kind or another. Perception has to be able to encounter the thing. It has to be extended in space. It has to persist through time, right? All those things are part of my prior map of what I meant by material nature, right? Nothing that doesn't have those things is part of material nature. Beethoven's Ninth Symphony is not part of material nature in that sense. The Windows operating system is not part of material nature in that sense. There may be instance of it that have manifestations, whatever, but both those things are too, uh, too close to being uh, abstract cultural products to simply be extended physical things. If it was an extended physical thing, I could tell you that, that the time when it begins, the time when it ends, a spatial ball that it stays inside of, right? If I can't tell you those things about something, it's not a piece of material nature, right? And the claim is that there are regional ontologies in the sense that however we divide up our experience, things like that, um, you're going to have different versions of things like that. Mathematical truths are not going to be in the same category. They're not going to have the same regional ontology as object of material nature. Okay. Um, the other thing you, you notice, you, you mentioned that, you know, uh, sometimes not translating the world, uh, translating the word abshatagung, perspectives. Um, I love he, that he, word. That word is very made very clear to me what he's talking about, the multiple side. I, I visualized a, like an incredible uh, 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 a jewel or something, a Star Trek type yes. of thing that twirls and takes you through time and, and all weird stuff. Yes, but, but really what he means is the fact that, you know, it can be seen from many sides, right? And the, the, the fundamental thing, he, what, is, what is he trying to say about that? He, uh, he's, he's, uh, he's making sport of the Lockean empiricist who thinks that the thing that he can hit with a stick is simple, <laughs> right? And what he's pointing out is saying, the thing, the thing that you think of as material, because you can hit it with a stick, has the characteristic that God himself could not see it except for one side at a time. because it is part of the necessary category of it is an extended spatial thing that it can only be, uh, it, uh, it can only be seen, interacted with, perceived one side at a time, right? That's not a limitation of your mind, right? It's, it's part of the, it's, 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 it's a necessary consequence of the, of the, uh, of the purely mathematical uh, entailments of the category extended thing. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, yeah. Now, this this uh, very interesting process of uh, uh, finding the the uh, more narrow, appropriate category for for the being idea. Uh, mm -hmm. It seems to me that what uh, Socrates, Plato, did was he he sort of adhered to this unification principle, and therefore he had the forms had to be in one sphere and the uh, you know, lower levels had to be in a different sphere. But uh, this world seems to be saying, no, 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 they're the higher and lower levels. They are their own separate level, you know, whatever. Am I totally, am I totally lunatic here? Okay, so it's great that you bring up Plato, right? 
and ideas, because we de definitely got to go there. There's a way in which um, uh, Husserl is um, way more Platonist than the other people before him, or maybe even than Heidegger after him. Um, but you're right that there's also ways in which he's a typical Cartesian, modern, uh, uh, you know, uh, world dude from the inside type, right? Um, as opposed to the uh, uh, single cosmos that just is, of which we occasionally have glimpses, uh, 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 Platonist type. The other thing, though, I wanted to bring up here is that this his war on naturalism is, in a way, a recapitulation of the uh, uh, the gigantomachia, the war of the giants over being that you, we get in Plato's Sophist. Right. The presentation in Plato's Sophist of the of the the war of the giants over being is there's two main camps. There's the materialist slash fluxus of the Heraclitian school, who say that if something is not matter, it does not exist, right? And then over on the other side, there are the Parmenideans who say that things like mind and life exist, right? Um, and that, they're, and that uh, neither mind nor life can be explained on the categories of uh, material existence, simply. So in that sense, uh, we're not only going over very similar ground, it's almost the same camps. Husserl is in the Platonic slash uh, Hermitidean side of that divide, right? He's in that camp. And he's in that camp in part because for him, the ideas are, the ideas um, exist. I was about to say the ideas are real, but uh, that's exactly what they're not. The ideas exist without being thing-like for Husserl. So this is where you start getting to his theory of intuition. So. Um, uh, Husserl thinks that we, uh, uh, we see ideas in things directly. Uh, the ideas we see in things, uh, it, the British empiricists would call them abstractions from things, but we see the general in the particular. He's not saying we see the general independent of the particular. He's not saying we get the generals as abstractions that come to us from language or terms. He's saying we have direct intuitions of the way in which an individual before us that we can use to think about something is an instance of a general form. And according to Husserl, and I think he's just empirically right about this, we can, by a deliberate internal act of shift of focus, move from thinking about that individual thing to thinking about the form of which it is an instance. And when we do that, we drop away all the parts that aren't part of that form. And when we do that, we can do that at any level of generality. We can keep it's just roughly square, or we can keep it's a three by five uh, 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 ratio uh, uh, parallel parallelogram rectangle, right, with beveled edges, right. The point is, we can pick how abstract we 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 go on that, and we could be and, and when we do this. And here I get, think I again think he's just right. When we do this, we can have direct intuitions of those conceptual abstractions at any level of generality, all the way up to highest genus and all the way down to the determinations of all the shapes of this particular without it actually being that particular. Okay, why does this matter? First of all, it's because he's he's giving you a um, a kind of direct intuition explanation for what ideas are and where they come from, which doesn't require any platonic hyperuranian realm of the ideas, you know, whatever, right? But he also is very forcefully distinguishing those abstractions as intended objects of thought, pure, pure concepts or pure idea-like things from any particulars that may be examples of them. They are not the. They are not something which is um, how to put it. They're, they're not a way of thinking about classes of the particulars. He'll insist on this strongly, right? When I think about you know uh, uh, the, the triangle that I'm uh, uh, doing math, uh, geometric reasoning about and proving things about geometrically, I'm not thinking about a whole class of triangles I could have drawn on the board, right? It's not an attempt to talk about uh, a large set of particulars at once. I'm talking about something else. 
and I'm allowed to be talking about something else because the intent, intentional object of my mind, right, is what I'm actually giving the sense to, right? So that's why his whole second main book is called Ideas. He has used phenomenology to completely rehabilitate platonic ideas. It's just his platonic ideas are not objective. Well, how to put it? They are objective, but they're obje objects of the mind, right? They're not uh, hyper-Uranian being. They're not cosmic ideas. They are um, conceptual ideas. But they are I otherwise ideas in all in the whole platonic outward look of the thing, abstracted from the thing, different from the thing sense. And he will even use this to give an explanation of how it is that our reasoning in mathematics works for all of our empirical sciences that use mathematics, right? You know, th th this, this is why you can uh, set up a physics problem as a math problem, solve the math problem, and then have a solution to the physics problem, right? Okay, so, uh, uh, and much of that is, you know, it's, uh, it's strongly disagreeing with the whole tradition of positivism and German, and, and, sorry, and uh, British empiricism that was around at the time. Um, and I think very sensibly so at a time when it was deeply fashionable to be anti-Platonist, it was pro-Platonist. <laughs> um, uh, but the other thing which is sort of distinctive in, in Husserl there compared to like the, the logicians or something is that he thinks all these things are, um, they are immediate intuitions. They are verified in immediate intuitions. They're not verified by a syntax of logical concatenations of concept, uh, concepts. They're not, they're not uh, deductions in, a, in an axiomatic system, right? They're not empirical observations. They are direct intuitions where you can see the idea itself. You can verify the step that you were taking. And you can see that, yes, this entails that. This is contained in that. This is a proper subset of that, whatever. All of those um, purely logical, not even logical, purely idea-like reasonings, uh, which are sort of logical or mathematical, so to speak, are what he calls the whole realm of the eidetic sciences, idea-like sciences, right? And his claim is that there's all kinds of things that we know about whole regions of being, which are just entailments of what we know about their idea-like structure. When we have a whole, a whole, you know, uh, uh, tree of life that we, uh, from kingdoms down to, you know, uh, uh, phyla, right? That whole structure we put on living things, right? Um, uh, that, that, that system of classification is not simply empirical, right? It's something that we, we derived, uh, created, uh, constructed from the, uh, um, the, the distinctions we put on things. This is, comes back to uh, Craig's point about no, prop, no proper classification. Uh, he thinks there are some proper classifications or something like that. Craig, you had a question? So there, there's another <clears throat> aspect there that, that what, what you intuit in your mind, what I intuit in my mind, uh, fall back to a certain commonality that allows us to compare and, and derive the same conclusion about them. Is there, so yeah, yeah, yes, and 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 for Husserl, he is ex, he is a typical enlightened rationalist in this regard. He thinks that we can come to the same conclusions if we're looking at the same things, right? And by looking at, I don't just mean looking at externally. I mean if we are considering in our consciousness the same intentional meanings, then we can uh, then we can understand the same things. He's no more uh, worried that we will come to different conclusions about those things than he's worried about two people studying real analysis coming to different conclusions about what uh, compactness means, right? He so thinks- there's a collective, there's a collective there, aspect there. There, 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 there. there certainly is an intersubjective agreement, but it's the intersubjective agreement is coming from the fact that each of the participants is independently verifying every step they are taking, right? and is seeing the same thing. So he, he is not worried about a kind of um, uh, subjective uh, method resulting in wild disagreement about what the meaning of X is, not even remotely. 
he, he thinks that to worry about that would be like worrying that uh, people in a math class will come to very different conclusions about, uh, about algebra, right? Uh, all that's going to happen is the people who aren't thinking about the math problem that, this, that the professor is talking about won't understand what he's talking about. If they understand what he's talking about, they're going to come to the same answer. And this is obviously a deeply contentious claim, right? Uh, uh, but it's the claim he's making, right? He thinks that the structures he is investigating here are um, necessary enough components of the nature of consciousness that when someone else doesn't see it, it's because they're not looking at the, the right thing or because they have misordered their concepts instead of ordering them in the correct way around, which is exactly what he is trying to clear up with this phenomenological reduction method, which is stripping away all the distortions they might have to some theory that they derived later. Okay, now if we compare Husserl to his successors, people like Heidegger, Heidegger is much more focused on the fact that um, uh, all of these intentional objects, all of these uh, uh, ascribed senses and meanings of things are motivated and they are motivated practically by a, uh, a Dasein that has its own existence and its own possibilities and isn't thinking in terms of uh, everyone else's. And if it is thinking in terms of everyone else's, that's pro probably because it is being inauthentic. It's because it's not being itself. It's being something, it's, it's just trying to get along with a they, right? So Heidegger is much more inclined to um, see uh, this motivated, practical uh, uh, um, uh, future, you know, your, your own possibilities thing as being something which is going to spread out the experiences and make them different from one another, from one person to another. Husserl, in part because he is focusing so much on the paradigm of perception and on the mathematical, um, thinks that uh, this internal precept, sorry, in, internal percept uh, method is going to lead people to the same conclusions if they're thinking about the same thing. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah. Um, okay. As you were as you were going through that in the last minute, I was thinking to myself, what if one has a sort of fundamental or, or uh, heated disagreement with one's uh, spouse, you know, situations that I'm personally remembering. And uh, basically, I see the reality of a situation, which would be a common problem, like a problem in the yard or with the house. I see the situation as having certain problems and certain uh, possible solutions. Mm -hmm. And she sees it almost entirely differently. It's almost like a different reality that she's seeing. Mm -hmm. And there's no way that I can sort of pierce into that and begin to try to argue with the fundamentals of it. Now, that would be the solution if I could get inside her mind and figure out what mistake she's making in, in the perception or how I'm differing from some perception she's making. But two independent subjective perceptions of what the real thing is, that's what leaves me in, in sort of a uh, wide-eyed situation. Can you clarify? Sure. So, so uh, uh... First of all, uh, um, to the extent that these are, you know, different motivated uh, 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 attitudes towards a situation, right, which could have entirely different um, uh, concerns, registers, time skills they're thinking about, et cetera, um, obviously you can have any degree of, uh, of different perception of what's important in the situation, et cetera. Um, the, the claim is not that those cannot be different, but that if you could see what the person was actually thinking and they could articulate that thought to you and you could look at the, those things the same way, you could understand it. Most people ne never articulate what, what they're thinking or why they're thinking it. Most people cannot tell you why they're thinking something. Most people are not phenomenologists. Most people have never, you know, performed this, you know, uh, epoche of suspending what they what they think from theory and just observe themselves thinking and watch like a movie uh, uh, the empirical process of their of their, of their uh, deductive thoughts. The claim is, if people did that with attention, they would be much more conscious about why they think what they think. If someone well, is, it, let me finish. If someone is extremely conscious of why they think what they think, the claim is they can then exhibit 
the reasons they have for it, they can exhibit their evidence to someone else who can try to look at the same things, might not come to the same conclusions, but could. The, 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 from, from Husserl's point of view, almost all of those misunderstandings come down to a person doesn't know why they think what they're thinking and they uh, uh, expect others to have arrived at the same conclusions without being able to explain why they arrived at them themselves. Um, and the, the, the way in which they arrived at them, they did arrive at them themselves is not something that they can often rationally justify to themselves. Right. So, uh, and then, by the way, when you get to the actual interpersonal, then they want uh, all of the people around them to make up for each of those failings, you know, in one way or another, right? By uh, uh, either kindness or intuition or, uh, under, or intuitive understanding or uh, 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 co commonality of purpose or whatever, right? Um, you can solve some of that by communication, right? But uh, what what Husserl is denying is that there is anything that either of the minds is doing in that situation, which is incommunicable to the others, right? He's claiming the lack of communication which obtains routinely is the result of the unconsciousness of the thinking and the inarticulateness of the participants as well as their impatience, not uh, the result of some, you know, a uh, fundamental sort of Worfian uh, untranslatability of the thoughts themselves. Okay, okay, I, I could I could fully appreciate that that uh, uh, semantics, uh, you know, failure to communicate accurately problem. But I, often, what seems to be at the root of the of the fundamental issue is a different perception about what is the causality behind the so-called problem or the so-called remedy and. The fact that there's a, 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 a misunderstanding of what could possibly have the causality, that brings in something you said about intention with causality that I'm interested to get back to. Causality well, and or intention in, in causality and the perception of causality. So, so, so uh, yeah, ca causality is separate. We can come back to a separate thing, but the, 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 it is possible that you could have disagreements that are based upon, you know, uh, uh, um, different theories about what is causally efficacious in the world, much more common than that is different priorities, different values and different concerns, right? Um, and this is something where, you know, uh, uh, Heidegger for that matter, Levinas would insist on these things way more because they're emphasizing the practical or they're emphasizing the ethical in these kinds of situations, uh, as opposed to the theoretical that you find emphasized in Husserl. Um, uh, uh, Levinas has a very simple answer to all these questions, by the way. Uh, it's the it's the old adage, if if, if in a, any family argument you find that you are in the right, apologize immediately. Um, he has this <laughs> he, he has this this ethical view that the uh, uh, almost a transcendent ethical view that um, the uh, uh, the pettiest concerns of the other are commands to me. Right, the the material needs of the other are my spiritual needs. Is the is the is the is the is the, is the traditional Jewish mm -hmm. formulation of this, right? Um, so uh, the 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 ethical is precisely the subordination of one's own concerns to the concerns of the other in Levinas, right? Um, uh, now, obviously, uh, Levinas himself thinks that this is incredibly noble, right? Uh, he doesn't necessarily look at what it, uh, consequences are for the imperialism of the effect of that on the other person, right? Uh, which is that, you know, uh, when this morality is, is adopted, you know, the uh, everyone must do what the bitchiest person in the house says, right? Um, uh, but uh, uh, so, which is not necessarily the way to run a, uh, run a household, right? But my, my point is that there, there, there are things like that which you get in sort of later people in this tradition who are going to ring the changes on uh, how overly theoretical they think Levinas is about all this, right? But Levinas is primarily thinking about problems of perception and knowledge and not primarily uh, problems of practice, actions, or ethics. And as a result, he's not focused on, um, I forgot about this way, uh, differences of values and so forth. Now, I will say that one of the reasons why he wants this uh, phenomenological method and this idea of different regions of being is because he wants he wants it to be the case that the um, 
that the human sciences, that cultural sciences, the cultural concerns and so forth, have their own spheres of validity, have their own types of being, have their own ways of being investigated. He doesn't want all those things reduced to um, some positivist physics imperialism that uh, pretends that, you know, sociology is really just a complicated way of trying to, you know, uh, 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 do large amounts of atomic physics at once, right? He's, he's an enemy of reductionism in that sense, if you get me, right? And, and in order to give autonomy to each of the different levels of analysis, he wants them to recognize as their own spheres of being with their own regional ontology and so forth, right? In a way that's his, his version of the um, uh, giving things like practice or ethics or, or, or differences of uh, uh, values there do is to let that be its own subject matter with its own concerns, right? Um, he himself is not giving you a whole bunch of stuff about what are the proper concerns of a uh, of a uh, phenomenological uh, theory of ethics. Don't worry, Levinas will, right? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Joe. That's very interesting. It almost sounds like, uh, uh, you know, the design for or the ap apologia for the idea that uh, uh, higher education began to develop into physics departments and bi biology departments and uh, philosophy departments and economics departments because those are different areas with different ontologies that are of their own really jargon at least yes and and the point the point here is that he he does think that each of these regions right uh ha has their own um uh in a way um uh logical infrastructure right and and ontology um and yes that's related to them being um separated disciplines the the the, the um the point that uh, Craig was making earlier on, though, is that uh, uh, later people think of these disciplines as having boundaries which are somewhat artificial, and actually they 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 cross fertilize in all kinds of strange ways, and uh, so things don't stay in their neat silos, right, uh, and so on, right, and people you know made much of that in the postmodernist period in particular, um, but uh, 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 compared to all that, Husserl is definitely a Enlightenment rationalist trying to continue the uh, Cartesian, you know, uh, uh, rationalist program of if we have a sufficiently uh, nuanced, rigorously grounded and subtle um, uh, understanding of reason, it can give each of these things its due in its appropriate place and so forth, right? He is a, a firm believer that uh, um, uh, with sufficient rationality, all these things can be managed, so to speak. When he writes the crisis of the European sciences, one of the reasons he's doing so, this is in the, his like his last work in the mid 1930s when you know, things have already gone to uh, crap in Germany and so forth. He's you know <laughs> he's, he's 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 literally had to leave the country because uh, he's Jewish um, and, and and so on, right? And he writes the crisis of the European sciences, um, and one of the things he's worried about is that. Um, uh, 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 people are all complaining that uh, 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 scientific life doesn't help them at all with any of the actual problems of existence, something like that. Um, that people are alienated from science and so they think that science has alienated them from life, something like that, this kind of typical Nietzschean uh, objection that's in the air at the time. Um, and uh, uh, he, he, Husserl, thinks that partly that's because um, science has given, uh, not science, rationality has gotten a bad name from the uh, um, the absurd overpromises of naturalism that it cannot possibly deliver, as well as its tendency to dismiss whole areas of human life as being groundless or irrational, right? Because it doesn't understand them, and that's part of what he's trying to remedy um, by uh, this appropriate division of things. Now, uh, he he still he, but he still has this uh, kind of uh, almost naive faith. I think there's a place in uh, um, uh, uh, Rosen where he, he describes uh, this this passage in, uh, in Husserl as showing at the same time um, uh, Hus Husserl's greatness of soul and his naivete, right? It's like he's got this, th th this view of if, if people were uh, rational in this programmatic way that I have sketched out, then, uh, um, you know, um, an enormous amount of uh, peace and enlightenment would reign, so to speak. Um, and this is, uh, there's a, there's a, a nobility in it, uh, but there's also a naivete in it, right? It's, it's uh, underestimating how hard the problem is, so to speak. Um, uh, 
uh, it's, it's expecting way too much from just being re reasonable, if I can put it that way. Um, uh, and to be, you know, why is that naivete? Because, you know, this is what he is writing in 1937. Right. So um, anyway, the, 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 you get the point. Um, uh, there was something else you mentioned, uh, you were talking about intentionality and causality, right? So um, let's talk about causality first for a second. Um, the, um, the critical, there, there's, two, there's two kinds of uh, uh, places that causality comes up. One, one is causality comes up in the critique of psychologism. And the other is it comes up in the description of uh, physical nature, right? Or physical science generally, right? Um, uh, and he's got different enemies here. Like one of the enemies is kind of a, 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 a human skepticism that thinks that you cannot know anything about causality and physical nature. He's he disagrees with that entirely, right? He thinks that uh, physicists can know necessary natural laws, right? So he's completely disagreeing with the kind of skepticism that that would regard all. Um, uh, ascriptions of causality to transcendent things as being um, uh, impossible. Um, he does think that all of those constructions, so to speak, have a hypothetical nature about them. They're something which could have been otherwise or could be otherwise, and therefore they're always going to have, in a sense, only empirical evidence for them, right? They don't have the same thing as logical or, or uh, apodictic evidence for them. Um, and he, he will insist on that di distinction. That's sort of the, the limit of his concession to Hume, so to speak, um, uh, on, on sort of in, uh, knowledge of empirical causality. But the other causality he's worried about is the, is the um, when the psychologists try to, ex try to uh, say something that is going to uh, try to constrain how the mind thinks, how the mind operates, as opposed to just watching it do it. Um, when it comes to uh, watching it do it, um, um, uh, Husserl thinks that he has direct uh, empirical uh, uh, factual evidence of the uh, staggering freedom and flexibility of the mind, right? He's, you know, he, he, he knows because he's done it, right? Um, and uh, 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 okay, so all that's on one side in the causality thing. The other thing though is uh, relationship between some of these things that are uh, causal and these things which are intentional. From him, sorry, for him, the, the intentional descriptions of sense have a kind of requirement to them which is not causal necessity. It's not like when the, the, the thing which I mean by the table um, uh, follows from some set of operations that happened in my head, right? Um, uh, with uh, with the necessity of you know uh, the, the the binding of oxygen and hydrogen together to form water, nothing like that, right? The 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 um, descriptions of sense that are coming from intentions are these willful meaning kind of things. When I say willful meaning, I I mean they're what I'm laying down as what I intend as the meaning of the system I am constructing, and the meanings that we intend in the systems you're constructing have a have a necessity to them of the following form. If you break them, absurdity results, right? That's not a causal necessity. It's a kind of uh, uh, normative necessity of uh, don't try to reason about things in a ways that breaks the descriptions of sense you originally gave to them. If, you, if you're trying to talk about the table, you cannot uh, simultaneously, you, you cannot, uh, Talk about you know the color of the the the, the internal quality of sense uh, of the color of the table or the mood you were in when you looked at the table or um, uh, uh, what uh, someone uh, uh, ten years from now will determine is the mass of the table by weighing it. None of those things are the table, right? And uh, it is a necessity of rationality and being able to reason about something that you regard the. Um, Int intentional ascriptions of sense to things as being um, uh, things you will not move, things you will not deviate from, right? But that's not a causal necessity sense. It's a, it's a necessity of coherence of reasoning, a necessity of rationality. So it's not a, it's not a uh, 
empirical necessity. And it's also not a logical necessity in the sense, well, it's a logical necessity of a certain sort. It's not a logical necessity in the sense of it follows from, you know, uh, uh, like, like the, like the uh, syllogism from a major and a minor premise, right? It's more like a rule you have to follow if you're going to, uh, if you're going to, if your reasonings are going to be truth preserving. If you want your reasonings to be truth preserving, you cannot upset the ascriptions of sense you gave to the terms when you laid them down. You cannot start a chain of reasoning having the X in your formula mean object A and six lines down have the X in your formula mean object B, where A is not equal to B. Your reasoning will fail, right? So that latter thing that I'm talking about is what he means by uh, um, the necessity in intentions, right? It's not a necessity in the sense of a causal necessity. And it's not a necessity in the sense of, you know, uh, um, um, a logical deduction. It's a requirement of making sense in the, in the uh, purely logical reasoning sense of the term. If you wanna make sense, you cannot change your uh, uh, intentional uh, connections between your language and terms and the things you're trying to be thinking about. Okay, so when he says intention, it's that last kind of thing he's really talking about, right? So what does this come up? You know, what do I mean by life? What do I mean by mind? What do I mean by you know uh, uh, some some particular mathematical concept, right? All of those are things where I I, I have to leave the the uh, intended object of the term the same if I'm going to reason about it, right? Um, I don't know if that helped or not. I mean, I don't know how obscure these things are because I've been over this ground a lot. So, um, sorry, Joe, you're on mute. I see you nodding, but you can't find the mute button. I was affirming that that was very clarifying and I'm very pleased with that. I'm going to be especially interested in watching it, uh, you know, later tonight or tomorrow on the uh, YouTube. Uh, okay. Yep. Uh, I find that, you know, these, these complex things, I, I think they'd be much better if I see them twice or three times. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, Craig, questions? How about terms? Do we, all, do we, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, let me see where I can get to. I mean, Air Liebness. Everyone knows what he means by an Air Liebness? No, I had trouble with that word. It, it's really just yeah, lived, sure. lived experience, we would say. Lived experience. So it's experience in the sense of um, undergone life. Um, Uh, yeah, the yes. Herausfassung was the other one that I was. Sorry, which one? Parse of parse. Which one? Herausfassung. Heraus I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to get one. the German German word without it without a spelling or a reference. Okay, so uh, page, page twenty, about five lines down, six lines down. Ah, yes. Okay. Um, Uh, so the, the issue here is he's trying to explain that notion of attention and he, he coins this word of, um, an exception where he means by a, a exception, a taking out of, right? He's not seeing exception in the sense of, you know, all of these things, all of these worlds are yours except Europa, right? He, he's saying exception in the sense of extracting from the rest of the field. So this is a coinage of his that has the, the, the structure of the word is the same as what we in Latin exception, but with the accent on the, you know, taking out part. So what he means by this is that when you're paying attention to something, you are extracting the thing that you were paying attention from out of the horizon of all the things around it. You are focusing on it and letting the things around it uh, be disregarded or, or, 
or less important. And that means that all of all all focuses of attentions are extractions of something from a, uh, from a a a broader um, medium in which they originally are embedded. Why is he bringing this up? Because the 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 thing that you get at the eminent layer is just the whole field without attention on it, and it's intentional acts that do that extracting for him, that do that focusing and extract this this piece from it. So my my whole visual field, you know, just a whole bunch of photons coming in is just this passive thing that I've organized it down into my computer is here and your face is on it there. Those are extractions I have made intentionally from the field. I've got this whole field of of, of eminent precepts, or percepts, whatever, and from it I extract things that are my intended objects, that are the things I'm ascribing meaning to, that I've extracted from that field. The the fact that those things are extracted from the field, the extracting part of that, is what that word is about. That word is saying well, that, that each perception that Gibson's, uh, exception. Gibson's theory of vision, then, basically, like Gibson's Gibson's theory of, of vision. That, yes. that the the processing is the extraction that's a necessary part of vision. We uh, our our vision is evolutionary in the sense that it learns to extract the tiger out of the forest so that we can stay alive. Right. And but the the critical thing here is he's saying that he's regarding that extraction as a particular intentional act, and that matters to him because the intentional part of it means. There's something that has been given a sense in that act. The part that I isolated on and, 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 and grabbed out, there was something I meant by that, and I'm giving some sense to that, and my future reasonings are trying to be about that. And what he's trying to get at is, what the hell is that that? And the answer is that that is not a piece of your visual field. It is not a set of, uh, of mere perceptions. It's the object of those perceptions. It's the transcendent thing that you're intending. And that's what you're ascribing the meaning to, right? So the the act of attention is uh, it's not it's not simply that it's constructing the object, but it is it is uh, it is giving a meaning to a intended ideal that is organizing that piece of the experience, um, right? Uh, uh, yeah. So this is the this is the um, the difference between the, what is extracted by attention and the horizon from which it is, is it is extracted. Um, uh, and the point the point of this is that kind of renders the thing you extracted independent of the rest of the horizon. But that and he, the the point of later on page twenty is that that independence is not something which is out in the real world. It's purely uh, for that consciousness, right? That's not to say that there isn't, uh, that, that the, your, your reasons for doing it can't correspond to things in the real world. It's just to say that, um, the extractions, uh, from experience performed by, by acts of attention are for the consciousness doing that extracting. That's sort of the last sentence that carries over to page 21 then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Even more, the, the, the previous italicized sentence, right? This independence is an independence only with respect to actual consciousness. Um, sorry, go ahead, Joe. Uh, yeah, that, uh, I hope my voice is on. The. Uh, the thing that came to mind there and struck me as being, well, I had had the pleasure of viewing a presentation by a magician, a person that did magic, particularly yes. the up close kind of magic. Yes. Table magic. And he explained the, the way in which it worked. They have a technique of focus, of drawing your attention away from what they're doing yes. with their active hand. Yes, and therefore, and since your attention is like a, is like a, a a flashlight, okay, you're extracting everything else away. You know, you're extracting yes. what you're you actually you, 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 you want, everything else. Right, so you won't see anything else. Yes, right. This is this is That's like the famous the, 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 the famous uh, 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 monkey passing the basketball illusion, right? 
Um, that was in the example, a film yes, he showed. Yes, 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 yes. Right. So, 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 yes. And, 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 and I mean, it's a, um, I think that this fact about a attention has been you know noticed by others you know uh, uh, even more since so to speak what's characteristic of Husserl is not that he's noticed this but that he is um, he's not viewing this as some limitation of a mechanical system he's not trying to contrast this with the imaginary um, ideal perfection of the electronic of an electronic eye right he's saying something more like um, Unless you've got an invariant in a convolutional neural net sense, right? Uh, you know, you 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 don't have the logical thing to which this is all referring. He's saying that he, he's saying something more like um, uh, e e even the electronic eye would have to focus like this in order to be able to uh, 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 extract meaningful reference uh, of its thoughts. You can't have meaningful reference about an external reality if all you're focused on is the pixelated interior of the imminent stream of consciousness. The pixelated in, uh, uh, you know, interior stream of consciousness doesn't have the information in it without the layer of the extraction slash abstraction slash exciting, excising and ascribing meaning to, right? That the structure of that process that he sees us doing directly is for Husserl what constitutes organized worlds, right? You only are in an organized world because you can routinely do that. It is not that, uh, wouldn't it be uh, better if you could pay attention to everything? No, right? Paying attention to everything is another one of those round squares, right? The only way you can pay attention to everything is if you take your attention across everything else in order to pay attention to the one thing that is everything, right? But it's only paying attention to one thing at that point. <laughs> you try to pay attention to do every bugab single my, thing, you don't pay attention. My bugaboo are people that claim that they're multitaskers. Uh, I would love to, uh, you know, pull a rug out from under them by doing the magician's trick, but uh, well, multitasking you, you, is an illusion. No, it's not. I know, I know it's not because I, I have a sister who raised four kids. Uh <laughs> no, no, no. That, that's just, that's just having uh, the ability to switch your attention, focus. Rapidly well, I know, I, I know what you're saying. Losing, saying. Without losing life coherence. I, I'm only part, that's not multitasking. I'm only okay. partly disagreeing with you uh, humorously, but but uh, uh, the degree to which people have to focus on one thing in order to do it well, or can focus on ten and juggle them all easily very significantly across people. Let's put it that way. Um, some people are better at what we call multitasking than others. Um, okay. I was suggesting more. It was in the, in the lines of <clears throat> the ones on LSD or psilocybin or ayahuasca in terms of the uh, extraction of perception where, where it yes. almost is inhibited, inhibited in that sense. That's right. And, they're so fascinated with everything. They're so fascinated with everything that they cannot, you know, uh, stick with anything long enough to, uh, uh, act meaningfully with regard to it. Yes. Um, no, it's a, it's a fair example. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, did we understand all this stuff in the naturalistic theory of being uh, about, you know, why he's violently disagreeing with, uh, with naturalism to core? I think we did. I think we covered most of this. Um, He's against the reification of consciousness. Why? He's against the reification of consciousness because trying to turn consciousness into a thing is uh, thinking that you can understand it better by understanding it like you understand physical things as though you understand physical things better than you understand your consciousness. Whereas actually, right, you have to, you have to create elaborate theories to understand uh, um, a physical thing like things or thing like things, and you have much more direct access to your consciousness. <laughs> It's backwards. Um, okay. Uh, right. So end of sixteen. Right. Uh, sorry. End of end of uh, uh, um, chapter one and sixteen. Uh, Levinas talks about the path which we should follow. We show on naturalism was founded on a certain conception of scientific and philosophical method. The very heart of naturalism, which everything follows, is conception of existence. Right. 
too narrow a conception of existence, which thinks of existence as the kind of existence that uh, external material things that are um, direct pre, uh, uh, object of perception have, right? That's too narrow a concept of existence. Um, and so the claim is that uh, under, it, he, Husserl is going to overthrow that ontology, which will lead to a different philosophical method and truth in general, right? Okay. So uh, truth in general, right? The, the, the point is that um, uh, Husserl is trying to break from the idea that a particular interpretation of how perception of external material things works is the uh, paradigm of truth. Right. First of all, we have to pay much more careful attention to how we actually underst understand things about external material things and interpret it correctly instead of incorrectly. Second of all, we're going to notice in doing so that uh, uh, the kind of truth that can happen there um, can happen in other areas and it does not require an external uh, physical thing as a precept to, in order to, uh, for truth to happen. What's necessary for truth to happen is that you uh, do not upset your uh, original descriptions of sense, pay attention to what you mean, and uh, uh, pay attention to your direct to what you know by direct intuition. Um, and uh, most of what, from Husserl's point of view, most of the errors that 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 result in too narrow a conception of truth that also result in uh, denying that truth, uh, that there is as much truth in the world as there actually is, come from um, failures to follow that procedure, right? That's the claim. Um, so if we, if we are not overly fascinated with how well we've managed to understand material things, right, and think that that's the way to understand anything that is, and anything that isn't that way isn't, then we will, uh, inst we will be able to know about uh, all sorts of things other than physical. Uh, material things. Okay, is that claim at least clear enough? At the end of one. I, I think I have to go to the next chapter to get that clarified. <laughs> okay. Uh, did we understand? We so you were talking about the the exception part. That was also the place where horizons come in. Horizons, by the way, which uh, happened there. This is. Uh, we, that was part of the extraction point. Also, have a you know, a giant life in 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 Heidegger, right? Who is going to be much more focused on the fact that those horizons, uh, that the horizon of a particular Dasein um, has a uh, 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 an eigenlijk, an, own, an an authentic own like character that is also um, limited in time. Um, well, we also we also saw this horizon concept in, in the. Uh... Uh, in the earlier Greek idea that uh, it's something that that is, uh, we know things that are inside the the clearing, but what's beyond yes. is the is the uh... yes, and and that's that's the that's the you know Heidegger harks back to that as the uh, the place where he thinks that their their notion of they had intimations the same notion of truth that uh, that he Heidegger agrees with, but that it's it's kind of that notion of truth which we're seeing here. I mean Heidegger is much more about that as you know the clearing. He makes makes it much more of the uh, of a theme, but uh, um, whereas uh, Husserl is also more inclined to see the horizon as something which is, um, uh, how to put it, uh, always there and full, so to speak. Um, uh, what do I mean by that? He Heidegger's version of a horizon is something more like a, uh, uh, a lighted region and a dark background, and, uh, and, and Husserl's is more like a a, a completely lighted stage with something at every uh, every visible pixel of it. I'm gonna put it that way. Um, but you can't possibly look at all of them, uh, so they might you can't. Well be you, your 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 attention your attention cannot be on them all, right? But but um, uh, and and uh, and Husserl will focus on the fact that the thing itself is only viewable from a single side. But it's Heidegger who's going to stress the fact that you. Um, uh, the, the, the tunnel of your tunnel vision includes a very short distance forward in time, right? Um, something like that. Uh, 
the 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 just ahead of itselfness of uh, of data science precepts. So th th there's a whole bunch of that stuff about horizons that gets, if I can put it this way, just made way more. It's way more developed in being in time than it is in in this. But this is where this is sort of. Uh, I wouldn't even say it's its origins because there are also uh, elements of that already in um, in Nietzsche. But uh, uh, anyway. Um, Heidegger is indebted to Husserl on some of this thematizing of the horizon. Um, okay. Uh, right. Uh, do you want to talk about logic? Maybe not. He has, he has the point about logic that the that the that logic as uh, trying to deal with something like a, um, a highest genus of object right doesn't actually deal with a highest genus of objects so it's not actually a genus of object it's just a form that objects take so he has this distinction between a uh, uh, a genus and a form a genus is something like uh, a categorization that has a uh, um, um, particular things under it and only those things under it, whereas uh, a form is uh, so contentless that it can be applied to anything. And his claim is that that's what's true of the uh, area of pure logic about the ideas like uh, object, relation, uh, so forth. Um, the basic basic number of things you get in, in logic as well. Um, OK. Uh, you, you, Joe. You started off by saying, you know, what's uh, uh, what about Berkeley? Or yeah, Berkeley? yeah, uh, because he might refer to it, and I've heard of. I know, I know generally Berkeley's claim of phenomenology, but I also uh, never distinguished that from naive solipsism, and I just basically I wasn't interested, so I didn't pursue learning more. Right. So, so, so what Berkeley, is Berkeley about uh, Berkeley is primarily, you know, trying to give kind of an interpretation of. Descartes that is saying if you start with Cartesian doubt, you're going to be stuck in solipsism, and something like that. That that uh, and, and this is not meant to be even a criticism of Descartes. It's meant to be um, uh, a deduction that for Berkeley, its primary purpose is to show that we are first and foremost minds. So Berkeley is an idealist and a religious idealist, but his 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 fundamental uh, conception is that it, you, he's willing to follow Descartes to the point of the Cartesian doubt, right? And then beyond the Cartesian doubt, he want, he's going to claim in sort of semi-human skeptical ways that all the knowledge of the uh, extended world outside the mind is um, uh, in some ways still contained inside the mind because it's still in the doubt in the in the brackets of remaining doubt. Uh, after the Cartesian, you know, uh, doubt procedure. So, uh, in that sense, the, the part of him that might seem to um, prefigure elements of Husserl is he's got a uh, entirely bracketed empirical external world, um, and he's got a uh, he's got something like a notion of a a consciousness which is um, uh, more certain than that, right? But for for Barclay, he wants all that to issue in the in the uh, uh, understanding conclusion, however you want to put it, um, that we are first and foremost minds, right? Um, uh, or that uh, uh, mind and God are the things that uh, uh, that uh, um, consciousness knows best, and the material world is a distant third, something like that, uh, that is always hypothetical. Um, so that's why he gets uh, equated with solipsism is, is uh, the, the, um, the, the doubt of the existence of the external world as being anything other than uh, uh, pictures for your mind, right, is the traditional sort of solipsistic thesis and, and sort of th that's where Berkeley is coming out in a way. Um, but that's sort of the, the, the um, where he's coming from and, and, and uh, how is how is uh, Husserl disagreeing with that in some ways violently, right? So that the, there's two primary places where he's disagreeing with it. Um, the first is from his point of view, uh, uh, Barclay is considering the mind as being too much like a a reified thing whose reality he thinks he think he Barclay thinks he is convinced of, right? 
uh, Barclay thinks that he needs to um, he needs evidence for something to exist from some uh, uh, um, uh, experience or safe conclusion, right? Um, uh, in the same way that a British empiricist does, he he's, he doesn't think uh, that the uh, the existence of consciousness is is uh, is an absolute. The absolute existence of consciousness in prior position, right? Uh, that you get in Husserl is not there in uh, in in Berkeley. For Berkeley, the existence of the ego is a deduction from the inability to, uh, to, to, to doubt the I think, therefore I am, right? Um, so he, he, Barclay is just following Descartes on that. Uh, people don't notice that Descartes was also following Augustine in that, but that, so there's a point of contact with, uh, through, through Barclay back to Augustine, but whatever, uh, sorry, through Descartes back to Augustine. Anyway, the, 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 that's the first objection, but the second objection and, to, and, and in some ways the bigger one is that for uh, for Husserl, he's not at all saying that the external world doesn't exist. Um, he's saying that it, it exists as an intentional uh, uh, an intentional transcendent object of consciousness, right? Uh, intentionality is precisely trying to point to this fact that the that the consciousness is always intending things about something outside of itself and over against itself that it regards as uh, as, as transcendent and actual. Um, the place where there's a little bit of agreement with, as I mentioned before, with uh, um, a concession to Hume or an ag agreement with with, with this, uh, you know, bracketing, so to speak, is uh, there's always something about um, empirical descriptions that could be otherwise compared to a truth of logic or a truth of mathematics or any other eidetic truth, right? Um, any ascription of uh, reality's existence, whatever, to transcendent things has that character. There's something hypothetical about it, so to speak. Um, but it's still what the, uh, uh, what the, uh, what we intend whenever we uh, have a, an object that we, whose sense to us is that it is outside of our consciousness. And uh, Husserl is an intu intuitionist, an intuitionist enough that he is trusting those descriptions of sense. And this is where there's often, you know, people who are not um, uh, Husserlians and aren't intuitionists of his variety, but have some of the old uh, skeptical uh, attitudes of the British empiricist look at Husserl and think he must be of solipsis because, you know, how, how, how could he possibly trust his intuition? Everybody knows that intuitions are just things that fool you and intuitions are things which aren't, aren't sound at all. And you have to have something you can hit with a stick where you can believe it and a mere subjective intuition. That's not the basis of anything, but that's not what Husserl thinks. Husserl thinks if he has, if he has an intuition about uh, a, a, an extra, an intended, something which is intended to be an external object, it's something he trusts, right? So for, for, uh, for him, that's not, doesn't have the form of a logical deduction. It has the form of a truth or, or a, uh, you know, a necessary truth of uh, logic or of uh, ontology or something like that. It's a imp purely empirical fact. I have evidence that the world exists. Why? I have perceptions of things that my mind uh, projects as existing in the world. And if my mind projection is existing in the world and that's what it intends, that's a direct intuition to me, which is the only kind of information I ever get about anything. So I trust it. It is, as, it is as founded on an evidentiary experience as anything else I can possibly think. So in that sense, it doesn't have a lower status for Husserl than uh, whereas it might have a lower status for someone who doubted all subjective experiences with some prior skepticism, right? So, okay. Um, why do people think that, that something like that doubt is there in in Husserl as well. The answer is because he does follow Cartesian procedure in lots of other other ways, and his his uh, um, transcendental reduction epoche uh, is in some ways similar to or like Cartesian doubt. You can come to it in a second. But the the this is this is the idea that you're trying to under watch what your mind is doing and how you think about things, as uh, while suspending every uh, every um, Thing you think you know from some physical theory, right? That's the sort of transcendental reduction. Put in brackets everything you think you know from some some theory about the world, and just watch your direct uh, 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 watch how you think how you think think about things. 
Um, uh, and if you if you regard that as uh, uh, equivalent to a uh, a Cartesian doubt that these theories are true, um, then you're going to if you think that the existence of the intended external world is one of the deductions from one of those theories, you'll think that he's a solipsist who cannot deduce the existence of the external world. Okay, that's not what he's not what he's doing. That the 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 point of the of the phenomenological reduction that brackets all everything you know from physical theories is to be able to just see what he calls the phenomenological domain itself. He wants you to be able to separate your observations about how you think from your observations about how you think the world works. And to be able to separate those as two region of beings with their own ontologies and their own rules, not because only one of them is real, but just because they're as different as physics and math, he wants you to be able to, he wants you to be able to focus on the pure how you think questions as the phenomenological questions, as opposed to the how the world works questions, which are, if you like, are the natural scientific questions, natural attitude and scientific questions, right? Both natural attitude and scientific questions are trying to understand things about how the external world works, not trying to understand how you think about the external world, right? And the phenomenological move is to shift the focus of attention towards how you think about the external world instead of the external world just to see how it works, just to see how the, how, the, uh, how the process of thinking works, right? And that's meant to be just a voluntary shift of attention that you can turn on and off, right? If you turn it on, you're, you're, you're turning on the voluntary focus, shifted the focus of your attention to not what I think about this table, but watching myself thinking about the table and trying to ask, what am I actually thinking about the table, right? Not for information about the table, but for information about me and about thinking, right? That's the phenomenological move. And there are elements of that which are certainly there in Descartes in the sense that there's the same kind of uh, introspection slash reflection method, but it's, uh, it's its own thing. But his, his reason for doing that is not because he doubts the existence of the external world or thinks the external world doesn't exist. It's because um, he wants to separate the sphere of uh, what is imminent in consciousness and consciousness's own acts from uh, what you think is true about the external world. Okay, Craig? So is he also taking, taking us into the direction of meaning and, and the aesthetic at that point too, more so than just the purely logical? Yes, but especially towards meaning, he, 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 he will include the, uh, the um, he, he mentions the aesthetic uh, uh, himself, and this is one of his favorite examples of a, of a, of a region of being that has its own uh, logical rules. He loves music as examples of this. Um, but uh, it's fair to say that for him, uh, the reason for doing that is just to show that these things are distinct, not because he is most concerned to found a theory of aesthetics or to found a theory of practice or to found a theory of ethics in its own way, right? He's, he, he is trying to show that those things will, are separate regions that could have their own uh, logic and ontologies. But the ones that he's most interested in are all the ones that have to do with theoretical knowledge, right? Um, so after he separated them off and he sort of says, oh, and one of my graduate students should go get a theory of aesthetics out of that. And now I'm back onto, you know, uh, how truth works and perception. And, <laughs> um, and this, is, this is the point that... Uh, Levinas himself makes um, that, uh, well, in a way he prefigures Heidegger's criticism that, that uh, um, uh, Husserl is too focused on the theoretical aspects of consciousness and not focused enough on the, uh, the fact that the consciousness is always a motivated consciousness and it has practical concerns and you know, practical possibilities and so forth. And that's something which Heidegger is going to, you know, grab away and run through center with, right? That's the, the big shift from uh, uh, earlier Husserl phenom phenomenology to being in time is the idea that it is, that the background horizon of concerns for uh, Dasein as opposed to consciousness is fundamentally practical, um, not fundamentally theoretical. 
um, and the theoretical consciousness is always a um, something which happens inside of the um, the everyday consciousness, inside of the uh, um, the practical consciousness, um, as a specific modification of it. And uh, in being time, Heidegger gives his own his own his own theory about uh, what the theoretical consciousness is as a modification of the practical consciousness, as a particular restriction of it. Um, and uh, in that sense, he, he, Heidegger, thinks that he has shown that um, all of Husserlian phenomenology sits inside his, Heidegger's broader understanding of being in the world um, as a, you know, uh, from his point of view, um, uh, Husserl only taught us things about the theoretical consciousness, not about all of consciousness. Um, so is the, you know, when you say practical, are we talking about intentional? Are we talking about survival? What, what aspects of practical right. are we talking about? Right. So uh, uh, in, in the case of, um, for Levinas, when he says intentional, he's not even thinking primarily practical or, or motivated. He's thinking just in terms of um, uh, created by subject acts, subjective acts of, uh, of focus or attention. Uh, and ascriptions of meaning in an almost logical sense, right? But when we get to Heidegger and he's talking about the practical, he's going to talk about the entire equipmental context, entire equipmental contexture in which Dasein lives, um, which includes all kinds of ascriptions of uh, causal relations to things, which are dealt with uh, te technologically, which are not seen as objects, but which are understood in this kind of um, um, equipmental um, teleological frame. And all of that projected on the uh, the Dasein's own possibilities for action, right? Uh, when I open the door, I use the latch, just a typical uh, Heideggerian uh, uh, example, right? There is no perception of the entire door as this object in space with many sides. There is the uh, conceptual understanding of a single, you know, focused on piece of the door. Uh, to which a possible application of a certain amount of force will allow me to to fulfill my uh, uh, prior intention of walking through it, right? And the the ordinary way in which uh, the Dasein interacts with the world is that entirely uh, possibilities of action, practical, um, if I can put it this way, um, disregarding of almost everything except what matters for the specific intention of the specific plan of action currently ahead of it for a very short period of time, right? When I say the practical focus in being in time, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that, that this idea that there are um, sort of immediate possibilities of action and that the meanings of things are ascribed to them for their role they can perform in acts that Dasein can do or ways that it can manipulate the world. There's a whole theory of being at hand in, in, in Heidegger about you know something uh, lying there ready for a certain purpose. It's understood in terms of its potentialities for action and so forth, um, as opposed to merely being present at hand, which is where the theoretical uh, attitude arises for Heidegger. And it arises precisely when the thing isn't acting the way you want it to, right? You notice the thing when you stumble on it. You treat the thing as a mere object that you puzzle at, you know, precisely when you do not know how to interact with it, right? Um, so there's a whole theory about how the transition to the theoretical way of just looking at the thing is uh, um, itself a motivated behavior that comes from uh, uh, a failure of the uh, of a of a more practical way of interacting with it as long as all of your expectations are being fulfilled and your way of interacting with the thing you don't pay any attention to its uh, non-salient characteristics outside of its utility right anyway there's there's a whole there's a whole theory of action and of the meanings of things in terms of their context of action in in being in time that's not there at all in in husserl yet right and that's what I mean by the shift of the focus to the, focus to the practical. Great question. Yeah, that's that's a good thing because uh, when I when I think practical, sometimes I go back to the basics of uh, need to need to feed yourself, need to uh, need to explore. You know, these kinds of things are very practical. And yes. uh, obviously, the the the, uh, the deer is one thing when it's captured and, and carved up for food. It's another thing when it got away. Yes. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and and there, it's there's no there's no you know um, uh, hierarchy of needs sort of psychology in 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 Heidegger yet, um, but there definitely is this uh, sense of uh, in the everyday world people are mostly uh, um, um, uh, the the world is viewed as equipment. This is the this is the uh, um, the, the the term of art for the the. Horizons of possibilities projected onto a world viewed as equipment, and the, the things which are, uh, you know, explored that are viewed theoretically are the things which are not performing as expected in that in the uh, in the context of equipment, or there are you know possibility future possibilities being explored, right? As you say, as you would say, um, but it's especially when a purpose is frustrated that that things are um, focused on as merely present to hand. Um, largely in an attempt to gain the information that can put them back into order, so to speak. Um, but uh, all, all of that is is the stuff you get first in basic problems of phenomenology and then in uh, in being in time from, from Heidegger as opposed to Husserl. Um, and then, by the way, after all that practical stuff has been has been emphasized by Heidegger, Levinas, you know, 30 years later will say, that's all very well, but what you left out was the entire um, ethical and awareness of the other uh, aspect of uh, uh, the structure of the life world. And that's only partly fair to Heidegger. Heidegger does bring in you know, relation to the other, but mostly as the relationship with the they, because he's in, he's famously in being in time trying to give the the structure of the uh, the everyday self, as he calls it, um, uh, the way people are most of the time. Um, and uh, uh, in, in that, he treats the, uh, um, uh, he's not looking at a boober-like, you know, relation, one-on-one -on -one relation to the other or the uh, uh, appearing of the, uh, of the face of the other that you get in, in Levinas. It's much more like just uh, there, there is a, an environment of being with the they, right, as this gray, you know, uh, everyone else and, uh, a, a, and what is expected as something which is part of the equipmental context, contexture and can be relied upon or not, can be threatening or not, right? Um, and uh, so the uh, the others, plural, as a they, are themselves projected on this uh, practical background. And that's something that uh, Levinas um, will object to, by later Levinas, he'll be objecting to that strongly and thinking that that's a a downplaying of the uh, of the ethical. Um, there is a whole ethic of its own in being in time, though, which is more about um, authentic existence and conscience and care and so forth. Um, so uh, uh, the understanding of the day as being primarily a practical background is meant in Heidegger to be something that inauthentic Dasein does most of the time, right? So uh, Levinas is partly um, uh, in, so, in some ways unfair to Heidegger but uh, on, on that subject, but mostly he's just disagreeing with him about what the nature of ethics is, right? Heidegger does have an ethical theory in being in time, but it's, uh, it's definitely not Levinas's ethics. <laughs> it's somebody else's ethics. Um, but anyway, uh, it's an ethics of authenticity, so to speak, rather than an ethics of uh, uh, service to the other. Um, but it's fair to say that as we've as phenomenology progressed, um, these focuses shifted, and one of the raps against it from some of the postmodernists later and from outside, so to speak, was that there seemed to be a certain arbitrariness and play in this. That um, what you found phenomenologically could be very theoretical in one place and very practical, but not ethical in another place, and very ethical and not necessarily very rationally th rational in a, in a third, right? Um, and uh, 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 it seemed like a play. Uh, how to put it? Um, people raised the question about how un how uh, underdetermined the contents of phenomenological method were. And you know, it was, was it something which you could find anything you wanted to find, so to speak. Um, so um, anyway, that's uh, stuff you get later in the, I'd say, 60s. Um, OK. Uh, particular questions on uh, 
we caught, we covered the Berkeley, which is good. Uh, that was like toward the end of two. Uh, I want to quickly talk about uh, next time. And the real question is, do we want to um, do one session more or two sessions more? Uh, um, uh, I think it's possible to finish this whole book uh, in one more session. I think, Craig, you might have already done that. Um, but uh, uh, if we if we wanted to split it into two, we would do um, uh, three to five next time, I would say. So that would be everything about intentionality of the consciousness, uh, theoretical consciousness, and intuition, um, some of which we've already talked uh, touched upon. And then we would be doing uh, um, essences, specifically philosophical intuition, and the conclusion for, the, for a third and final thing. Um, so that's roughly 60 pages next time and 50 the time after if we did it in two. Um, is that, I see, yeah, Joe is, Joe is nodding and saying yes to two. Okay, um, and then uh, time-wise, since people actually have the book now, is the, is the 7th of March okay? Two weeks? Craig, can you check if the sec is the second of March works? Seventh of March, rather. Yeah, seventh of March works for me. Okay. Okay, so let's plan on the seventh for uh, chapters three through five. Um, okay. And intentionality, we've already covered a bit, but uh, theoretical consciousness and intuition. Let's also just uh, try next time to have um, a deeper discussion of what intuition means. Um, sensibility and intuition. All right, um, I guess the last thing uh, I'll say is um, if there are uh, particular topics about uh, Husserl or Levinas that you wanna know more about, um, think of them between now and next time and you know, bring extra questions besides on the reading. Um, if, there, if any of this sparked areas of interest or concern, um, can try to add, uh, add some things to the reading itself about um, influences, background, other sources, other books to read, anything like that. Hmm. Well, thank you very much. OK. Seeing Craig nodding, so are we good? Yeah, I'm good. All right, we'll see you in a couple weeks. And I'll put this up on YouTube later. Thanks. <laughs>